to the 25th meeting of the committee in 2014. Everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they may affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some of our committee members will refer to tablets during the course of the meeting. Uh, that's because we provide papers in that format. And our first item of business today is our third oral evidence session on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. We have three panels giving evidence this morning. I'd like to welcome the first panel, um, Archie McGregor, Land and Property Development Manager, uh, and Alan Thompson, Head of Corporate Relations at Scottish Water, and John Hosey, Community Regeneration and Health Manager at Dundee City Council, uh, and Judith Proctor, Corporate Lead, Integration and General Manager, Murray Community Health Partnership of NHS Grampian. Uh, we were also supposed to have a representative from North Lanarkshire Council, who uh, unfortunately has uh, pulled out of this session uh, at the last minute, uh, which uh, I have to say that the uh, Personally, I am extremely disappointed um, about that situation. Um, could I welcome uh, those of you who have uh, come this morning? And I wonder if you have any opening remarks that you would like to relay to the committee? No. In which case, we <laughs> will move on. Um, let me start you off um, with... Uh, uh, a very simple question. Why do you think these new powers, or proposed new powers, are necessary? Um, and do you think there will be changes in current practice? Ms Proctor, would you like to start, please? Yes, thank you. Good morning, uh, committee. Um, NHS Grampian very much welcomed the uh, proposals set out in the Community Empowerment Bill, and in particular the opportunities that we see uh, within the provisions of the Bill for us to engage very deeply with communities and to co-create sustainable services for the future. Um, we did, however, note that, uh, as, as in common with some of the other uh, submissions that you've had, that engagement goes so far, and actually we see a lot of the opportunities through, for example, the locality working that's uh, um, uh, allowed through the Public Bodies Bill to, to really co-produce uh, services with people. So we had hoped for further clarity around that. So, so we think that the opportunities that exist in the Community uh, Empowerment Bill are significant. Uh, we recognise some of the potential challenges for us in, in delivering on, on that. Um, but I think the, uh, the potential in this for communities, for people across Scotland, to, to really engage with public services and to help co-produce those is significant. Okay, Mr. Thompson, please. Right, I'll, I'll choose going to uh, Mr. McGregor, then, please. If you uh, could just you. signal to me, guys, which one of you are <laughs> is likely to, that would be helpful for me. Okay. Um, Mr. McGregor. Um, you know, Scottish Water is also very supportive of the uh, legislation, uh, giving uh, communities the, the opportunity to submit, uh, particularly the asset transfer request element of it. Um, I think one of the reasons it's needed is that um, the existing framework in, in which public bodies operate uh, is very much driven, very formal process, whereby uh, asset transfers can only happen at um, market value. Um, there's no uh, existing guidance as regards leases or uh, arrangements whereby communities can come forward and just make uh, use of assets or, or apply for transfer. The only other thing in operation is the community right to buy, which of course applies to rural areas at the moment. So uh, a broadening of that uh, principle for communities to get involved, uh, I think is to be welcomed. I wonder, Mr McGregor, because I'm not fully aware of um, the, the rules and regulations that would apply to, to Scottish Water, mm -hmm. but obviously an asset um, can be sold for less than market value uh, from other public bodies if there is ministerial uh, approval for that sale at less than market value. Would that apply to that, Scottish that, Water too? That is, that is correct, um, but I think what this legislation will do is, is uh, provide much more yep. of a framework that will give confidence to officers to deal with requests from communities. It, it was just to clarify whether the, the um, rules that apply to, to other public bodies apply to you too at this moment. That's useful. Thank you. Mr Hosey, please. Yeah, the, the bill is welcome because it endorses many people's aspirations to see more empowered communities uh, 
So that's positive. There are, there are many diverse opportunities. I think some of the challenges are in, uh, particularly in uh, some areas of greatest deprivation, the support levels that are required to help groups to uh, evidence need and to consult within their own communities and the, the support role of others to help them go through the process, acquire an asset and sustain it. And I don't think that should be underestimated. OK. Can I ask you, Mr Hosey, just a, a, of general interest, your title is Community Regeneration and Health Manager. Yeah. Um, are you funded jointly by the Council and by NHS Tayside? Or? No, fully by Dundee City Council. OK, I think that's useful too. Anne McTaggart, please. Thank you, um, and thank you, Mr Hosey, for that. It leads me on to the next question. Some of your communities, um, obviously, you've kind of illustrated that, that don't have the capacity to take on um, the advantages of the provision and the proposed bill. Um, what will your organisation do to assist these communities? Uh, uh, start with Mr Hosey first, please. OK. Um, well, I mean, in Dundee, we have a, a, a well-established structure for the coordination of local community planning. Uh, within the eight multi-member awards, we've got a local community planning partnership, which is chaired by a first to third tier officer of the council, involves elected members, council departments, NHS, police, fire and rescue, and also up to six local people who are representatives of key community organisations. So we've got a strategic mechanism in the city that will assist when we're raising awareness of matters to do with asset transfer. And the, the area of work that I'm responsible for, which is uh, community regeneration, there's a direct link there in terms of the staff that are part of my management who, who currently have roles and capacity building across a diverse, diverse range of community groups. So I, I think that a multi-agency approach which reflects our partnerships is, is probably key to that. Uh, but we don't see ourselves doing anything different in principle than we do at the moment. This just gives it a very different dimension. OK, and Scottish Water, um, do you want to comment on that, Mr Thompson? Yeah, the, um, um, I, I guess the, 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 the support of communities w w would be wide and ranging. Uh, just an example could be with um, fisheries groups and, and reservoirs, where um, some community groups would, would like to buy the reservoir. But in actual fact, the the potential ongoing maintenance of the reservoir is not the thing that's in best interest for them. So we would look to then work with them and negotiate leases. If it was redundant reservoirs, we would then try and look to see if um, there's one in particular where it's, it's used for unemployed people and well-being and a, a number of other initiatives. And what we've actually agreed to do then is enter into a longer-term lease so that if the reservoir was actually sold, then the lease goes with it. So there'll be a, a range of different things that we, we, can, we can do to, to try and work with communities. Sorry, can I just ask a wee supplementary there? What, can, what, what would you do proactively for to encourage some of the community members? Uh, well, we'd have an, in that example there, we have an involvement uh, with the, the, the fisheries group. So we, we have a you know, dialogue with them. There's leases on, ongoing, but it, it tends to then be if there was something going to happen with that reservoir and we look within the, the longer term. But we, um, we've got community managers right across the country um, that lays with, with the property uh, colleagues as well. Uh, Ms Proctor, please. Would probably build on some of the comments from, from my colleagues on the, on the panel in terms of the, the, the provisions in the bill enabling us to be more impactful in the work that we're doing to engage with communities and build capacity there. I mean, NHS Grampian as a, as a board has responsibility for layers of public health through, through the organisation and within CHPs we have responsibility for community wellbeing, uh, health improvement at that level. Um, and I think that those are all of the, the resources that we would begin to apply to, and are already applying actually, to, to building and creating capacity into communities to participate in the work that we do and to, to co-create with us the services in the future. NHS Grampian obviously has a duty as a, a, a partner within the local 
uh, community planning partnerships, of which there are three in the North East uh, and in Grampian, uh, and of course that role uh, places a duty on them to, to engage with communities. I'd also point out um, the, the, the committee will be well aware of the key elements within the Public Bodies Act and the creation of the Bodies Corporate, the Integrated Joint Boards. Uh, we will have to set out in our integration schemes how we will be engaging with and encouraging communities to participate. Um, and certainly we had uh, pointed out in our submission to, to this committee um, the need to ensure that we're, we're, we're being uh, um, aligned with those things rather than working in two parallel processes so we can really maximise our input there. Obviously the strategic plan is a significant vehicle for, for engaging with and working with communities and particularly at that real locality level which I think begins to address some of the challenges that we see around some communities and communities of interest uh, being better able than others potentially to, to take part. So I think the, the opportunities with the Public Bodies Bill for us to focus on localities might enable us to target some of that work at uh, deprived communities or, or disadvantaged communities there. Um, we as a public body have been undertaking a lot of work under policies such as reshaping care for older people and I think there are opportunities within the work that's been happening there to build on that engagement and to, to continue the dialogues that we're having with our communities and shaping future services. Um, I wonder if I could come back to you, Ms Proctor, and I'm going back to yesteryear um, in a deprived community in Aberdeen where NHS Grampian came out to consult about local health priorities. Mm. Um, and the folks there, surprisingly for me, uh, felt that their main priority was tackling mental health um, in that particular area. Uh, NHS Grampian's priority um, was to get folk off smoking. Um, now, the community gave its view, um, a, a fair amount of members of the community gave their view, um, and yet that didn't feature in NHS Grampian's priority list. So have things changed since that time, or do we pay, um, or do some organisations pay lip service to consultation and forget the views that are put over by communities? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a, a very good question and I would, I would respond by saying that there, there, there seems to me a, a, a potential for tension between that real engagement with communities and of course the statutory obligations and the targets that some public bodies are, are subject to. Um, I think the, the challenge for us all in this, in terms of policy makers as well as, as, as public bodies, is to balance the, the, the rights and responsibilities and opportunities within communities to, to those other priorities that, 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 that come to us. I think one of the challenges, again, that, that we pointed uh, out in our, our response to the, the, the consultation around the bill was where um, some of those, those, those tensions become very apparent. So, for example, around the requirements for major service change when uh, services and change has been signalled very clearly by a community, but, but actually what we're seeing is a tension then because that's seen as major service change that, 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 that may be a challenge uh, politically, both locally and, and, and nationally. I think it is, it is uh, challenging. I think uh, engaging with communities can be very, very challenging. There can be more than one view and opinion, uh, and so we have to balance uh, that through, through being really, really clear in our approaches and the way that we're working, that we're listening to, to all voices there. I understand that uh, you know that these things can be challenging, mm. but what I feel, and you know, the committee has been um, right round the country in recent times uh, talking to folks about various issues. Sometimes my feeling is that common sense doesn't come into play. And if we go back to my example, you know, if there are folks out there with a lot of mental health problems which are not being addressed, it's hardly likely that they're going to be able to give up smoking. Um, which may be the only thing that's uh, keeping them going at that moment in time. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know that there are targets, there are uh, priorities laid down by others, but, you know, I, I, I think it's a pretty pointless exercise going out and speaking to folk, getting those opinions. Common sense would dictate to me that you're not going to reach your other targets unless you're going to address that issue. Um, obviously, participation requests themselves are going to give folks more of an ability to influence these things. How do you think that that will make a difference? How do we get common sense to come into play? Um, the, the 
common sense element is about the really understanding what it is that our, our communities want. And I, and I think this is as much about a, a genuine dialogue because we have to be really clear as, a, as an NHS board uh, with our communities, the elements of service that we're able to provide and the resources that we have to do that. I think some of the, the, the examples around participatory uh, budget setting get us into that dialogue, that really productive dialogue that a board, no public body can do everything that we might want to do and everything a community or individuals within that community might want to do. But what we can do is enter into a very genuine discussion about what people want, where their priorities are, where some of our challenges and targets and statutory duties are, and to find that pragmatic way forward that we can deliver on all of those as much as, that, as we're able to. Uh, and I think that involves a real uh, shift. It involves a shift in the way that we work, and it involves a, a shift in the way that we all think uh, about how we do that, because that, that dialogue and that discussion doesn't happen quickly. It takes time to, to build or, or rebuild trust in communities where maybe we've not done that before. Uh, and I think that element of, of, of needing to take time to do this is really important. OK. Alec Rowley, please. Hey, good morning. Given the, that the, um, the panel everyone welcomes this poll, I'm just trying to, to get my head around the participation requests and what is your understanding of that? I mean, is, is there practical examples that you can give where you can see community organisations coming along with a participation request? What does that really mean if we're trying to explain that to local community groups? Let's start with Mr Hosey, please. Uh, I mean, at the moment, I should say that in Dundee, we are in the, the early stages of this journey. So we, we at the moment, would see that as something we will accommodate <coughs> and incorporate in future and help groups to see the, the rights that they have to, to, to make these requests. Uh, as I say, at the moment, we haven't had any requests, but we're prepared to refine our strategy uh, once the bill is implemented and make local groups aware of the opportunities that are there. Do you want to maybe expand on what would happen at this moment in time without the bill being in place? If a community came to, to you and said, you know, um, we don't think this service is being delivered right, we want to know what the thinking is round about um, this delivery and the budget that's gone in there. Um, and then they want to influence that. How would they do that at present without the bill? I think would be yeah, interesting okay. for no, that, the That's helpful. I mean, what we have, we've got a part-time asset transfer coordinator post, which has been in place since December last year. It's only 10 hours a week, but that, that's a first point of contact for for most groups and organisations. We've tried to raise awareness. This person has done a lot of uh, groundwork to help groups see what's coming. Um, we've got our information posted online and we're in the process of increasing that information and directing community groups to that. I guess in short is that we would welcome, if we're approached by any given community group, we'll sit down with them and talk through the issues that they see are local priorities and work out ways as to how we can take that forward. Now, that may be uh, something that comes to nothing or something that can go through a process. I don't know if that answers the question. OK. Scottish Water, please. Uh, yeah, uh, we, uh, we deal extensively with uh, communities r right across the country. A, a lot of that's to do with our, our capital programme and, and the, the delivery of, of, of services for customers. So we've got a structure within our business that we have got regional community managers and they work with our capital and delivery teams, but we also issue all contacts to local councillors. We've got a public affairs department um, as you um, contact details to all our, uh, our MSPs across the country. So we try to make as many channels open as we can do for, for customers to approach us, um, either with us engaging with them in the community because we want to do something or equally so back into Scottish Water. Um, when we get these requests in, we would then liaise across the business with the land and property departments to then move these requests forward and, and enter into dialogue and negotiation with people to see what can be done. Ms Proctor, please. I, 
I don't think there's a formal process within NHS Grampian uh, at, at the moment for, for, for dealing with such requests and, and obviously the provisions of the bill w would support that sort of for formal process but uh, examples of, of working alongside communities uh, would happen through our community health partnership structures potentially um, um, with direct uh, requests to the board itself and I think in particular related to specific services so uh, I can certainly imagine uh, requests for service change and uh, for participation where service change is proposed and there will be examples of that throughout the NHS Scotland where we're remodelling or redesigning services um, and where particular uh, patient groups will want to be involved in the design of those services and where we would seek to involve them in that and also possibly and potentially where we were looking to, to remodel or change building based services uh, so I, I could certainly see where requests for participation in those things uh, would come through and the the um, the uh, opportunity of having a formal pro process around that I think would hopefully make it much easier for communities to understand how they can then engage because I could imagine that at the moment it's probably feels quite complex to know where you would approach a board uh, in order to to participate in some service change. Alec please. So I'm just trying to I'm trying to really get to this participation request process and, and wonder if organisations have thought thought it through properly because my reading it in, 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 in many ways is that a local organisation could look, for example, at the, at the community partnership, planning partnership in your area. Um, and if, if you've got an outcome there that is to improve health and well being through healthy eating and exercise and a local body think you're not doing it too well they could come along and say to you, actually, we could basically get involved in the delivery of that service. We could have healthy eating classes and engage people better than you are. And their local football team can get involved in running sport and, and leisure to fitting people up. Therefore, the outcomes will be that people will be fitter. The outcomes will be that people will be eating healthier. That's in line with the strategic plan you have. We want to deliver that. We're placing a request to you. How do you then deal with that? Because that's my understanding of uh, uh, what could happen yes. if this bill is passed that you've just welcomed. Yes, I think that's a really, really good example of, of, of how the, the formal uh, partic participation request w w would operate. Um, I would say from a, a board and a community health perspective, um, that is exactly the sort of partnership working we've been looking to develop in CHPs and certainly will be looking to develop even further through public bodies work and the integration work they're involved in and with localities, getting community groups uh, to, to, to take part uh, in, in those processes and take on those, those services to help us achieve those outcomes has to be the ideal uh, for all of us. So creating the, the, the formal routes where we can uh, make it known to our communities how, how they can avail themselves of those opportunities um, is, is, is certainly something that as public bodies we will need to, to undertake. And do you think you would have to change significantly? Because one of the criticisms mm -hmm. of the community planning partnerships is basically that the third sector and others feel excluded. Mm -hmm. They're basically run by the local authority yeah. and the next big partners, the NHS, yeah. on that. Um, and the idea of this is that at that, that mm -hmm. community level, these people could come forward and say, we can, mm -hmm. we can hit these, mm -hmm. these outcomes, we can demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the relationship has to change. It's not about, about them simply being in there to do, you know, and they've got to demonstrate that. And my other, my other point about that is, how geared up you, you are to that or how geared up you would have to be, does that mean significant change within your organisations? Mm -hmm. If we're talking about, about community organisations taking a, a, a greater role in the delivery of these services, what does that mean for your organisation? Are you equipped for that right now? Will it mean significant mm -hmm. change? Mm -hmm. And my final point on it would be that it does say that, that, that the, the authority, the, the local authority, the health authority, whoever it is, must agree, if, if, if they can demonstrate that they're going to have these outcomes, must agree unless there's reasonable grounds not to do so. Um, what, um, are definitionally reasonable and, and, and should there be an appeal process there for that? But how geared up are you to actually make that shift? Because that would be a significant shift if the local community group comes along and says we could basically mm. hit these outcomes. Please. Yeah. 
So, yes, um, I, I do think it involves a, a, a shift in the, the way that we think, but I, 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 I believe that it builds on work that we've been trying to achieve through community health, community health partnerships, um, local work that's been happening under the umbrella of community planning for a number of years, uh, third sector, uh, private sector also, you know, but third sector in particular are, are key to us being able to deliver this. And I think the roles of the developing third sector interfaces is really important and where we Whilst we also need to build capacity within communities to do this, we also need to support our, our emerging third sector interfaces to, to, to build some of that capacity at a, at a very, very local level. I think of ter in terms of uh, getting geared up for this, um, my response with, with my focus around, around health and social care integration is that the, the work that we will do in defining our localities under that legislation and defining how we engage and encourage localities to participate will be the, the gearing up part of that and that really gives us that 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 clear um approach to to working with the the resources that are in a local community and working with the assets that are there uh, to, to shape services i'm not sure if that answers your all your points Sorry. could i ask just yeah. a final question i mean to the panel how at, at the current time i noticed for example in terms of scottish water there's there wasn't much talk there about outcomes. How, how good do you think public bodies actually are in, in, in clearly defining outcomes and, and, and organising services and organising budgets based on what the outcomes are that you're trying to get? How good do you get that and how good do you get measuring that and okay. how do you report that? Mr Thompson? Yep, I mean, certainly for, for Scottish Water, our outcomes are heavily measured and they're based on ministerial objectives. So. Um, when you look at our, our um, business plan that's, that's just um, been announced from uh, 2015 to 21, that was formed after extensive consultation with uh, customers, customer forum, um, our regulators, SEPA, drinking water quality regulators. But this particular business plan included customers more than it's ever done about what the customers want to see in terms of water quality, wastewater, um, flooding, a whole range of, of things that customers want and also balanced against what the customers want to pay for um, these services, how much within that. So I'm delighted to say that, uh, that the plan was just agreed, which is going to see um, considerable um, benefits for our customers. We've also agreed the only um, utility in the UK to agree that our prices will be fixed at 1.6% until 2018. So we've given price uh, stability for customers with a whole range of outcomes that we need to do right across the country. So these are very measured and targeted um, by, um, by our regulators and agreed in a, in a package of, of measures. So that's broadly speaking how the water industry works in terms of uh, in our business plan. But your point there about how do we engage communities, I think that every organisation, we've always got to be open to new opportunities, not to close things down. The point that was made about common sense, I think, is, is very apt um, about how do we remain alert to opportunities to work with communities, both in terms of what we want out of this, because at the end of the day, we need to do certain things with capital programme, we need to engage with communities. It's not just a case of us coming along and dig, dig, build, build, and everybody should be grateful. We have to engage and meaningful with our communities to make sure that that when we do arrive to, to, to make improvements, that we're, you know, we're doing it in a very collaborative way, um, working with sensitive communities where we've, where we've been in before, and, and trying to learn from these experiences and make it a better outcome. Uh, for our customers. Let, let's look at um, an example um, yep. for Scottish Water, which I think is probably an apt one. Uh, you've talked about all of the engagement that you do with the regulators, with government and your ministerial targets and, and the rest. Um, but let's look at um, Aberdeen, where you know I think I can give the best example. Um, flooding difficulties in the Merchant Quarter, yep. the green area of, the, uh, of Aberdeen. Um, where businesses and residents have had uh, real difficulties in understanding uh, what Scottish Water have been doing to resolve the difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, these folks decide that they've had enough after this bill is enacted uh, and they put in a participation request to try and influence um, change um, in terms of maybe the capital plan or in terms of what you are actually doing to resolve their difficulty. How do you deal with that? 
how do you cope with that? Well, certainly the, the example you mentioned there uh, in Aberdeen is, um, of, of, of the Merchant Quarter, we have been engaging with the local businesses and, and, and groups. Um, we've also been engaging with the local authorities. And I think the, the, the key thing for us uh, in that, these particular examples is to actually understand what the root cause of the problem is. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, flooding is, is a terrible thing to happen f um, for, for any customer, particularly internal flooding, where our capital programme focuses on reducing customers at risk of internal uh, flooding. So there's been a lot of good work over the years on that. External flooding uh, is something that we're looking at in our next programme to actually understand and actually define what areas across Scotland are actually um, at most at risk and then what interventions we can actually put in place to alleviate the, the, the flooding for, for customers. So we but would look at can, it... Can I stop you, Mr yeah. Thompson, because obviously, you know, um, you have got Scotland-wide priorities. Ms Proctor has got um, priorities right across Grampian. Um, Mr. Hosey has got priorities uh, throughout the city of Dundee. But, you know, the folks who have businesses and live in the green mm. area in Aberdeen, you know, they're interested in their little bit. Yeah. You talked about communication. Um, an argument that would be given by a lot of those folks is that they don't feel that they've been com communicated with particularly well. Um, and, you know, they feel mm -hmm. that they have been unable to influence what you are doing. Um, this gives them the right. And, you know, quite frankly, if you go back to them and talk the way that you've done here about your Scotland-wide priorities, um, you know, they're going to turn around uh, again and say, you know, that communication um, is of no value to me. So how do you ensure that you gain that involvement you make sure that the communication is right yeah. for the difficulty that they have rather than talking to, to us about your Scotland-wide priorities? Well, what we do with, with all communities, not just at Aberdeen, where we've got specific uh, hotspot problems, if you, if you like, where we don't quite understand uh, yet what, what the, the, the solution is and also how best to resolve this, because at the end of the day, it could be a surface water. Um, um, problem that, that it's not actually a sewer incapacity, it might be surface water. So our key on that would be to make sure in these communities that we give name contacts within the community that they can contact is that they're not going through the organisation and having to tell everybody that you know the, the, the background to it. So we'll try and get an ease of contact to make sure that we're engaging with customers. We will try and always put in interim measures to help customers where we can do if we don't have the fix yet known. And if I take an example of, of Glasgow, and forgive me, you mentioned obviously Aberdeen, but to, to give a context... And hey, I'm not trying to be parochial. Uh, I know, but it's, just, it's just to give a good example of our understanding, and this is what we're rolling out to different areas. In Glasgow, we had a, a, a lot of areas that suffered from, from flooding. And the problem was everybody wanted to say, well, it's, it's the sewers, no, it's not the surface water, or it's the water courses. And the reality to it was nobody actually knew what the problem was because everybody wanted to pour concrete and come up with a solution that might not have been the best sustainable solution. So in Glasgow, we agreed in a partnership with Glasgow City Council, ourselves and SEPA, and at that time Scottish Enterprise Glasgow and Clyde Gateway, that we would spend money actually understanding what the problem was. And we created integrated models of uh, catchment models to understand what happens in certain rainfall events. The upshot of that is that now in Glasgow we have that information and Clyde Gateway are now spending £7 million on regional um, um, suds ponds. We've just announced £250 million in the city of Glasgow um, to improve the, the, the infrastructure. And Glasgow City Council spent money in flood prevention. Now, without that information, we would all have been away spending money in our own capital programmes. But with actually with the knowledge now of actually uh, these models, it's actually not about putting the water in pipes, it's about how do you manage the water above the system. So for me, that's a great example now of many communities right across Glasgow, and indeed in other areas when we get that type of understanding, where it'll be far better for communities on what the actual solution will be, and it's not just a patch and repair. OK, Mr Hosey, please. This question was about outcomes. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I guess our, our guide is the single outcome agreement and the delivery plan, which include matters relating to asset transfer, capacity building, improvement in service delivery. So we, we have a framework there that uh, is complementary to our local community planning process. Um, a few years ago, we developed uh, an impact assessment for our local community plans, and that would cover the next time we do that is halfway through our current plans, which are 212 to 217. Uh, we developed a triangulation system between service where we would engage with ser service planners, providers, the active and engaged community, people who are already involved in their community through community councils or housing groups or representative structures and the general public. So that would be one measure. Uh, the last time we did it, we tested it and we couldn't find any other examples in Scotland where there had been an impact assessment undertaken on local community plans. Now, the plans are rolling plans, so as matters relating to asset transfer emerge, they will be incorporated in our local plans. So there's a system there which will allow us to measure how effective we are in meeting the objectives and outcomes. And I should say that the plans are based on engagement with local people. It's purely, they are not top-down actions that are in the plans. It is across the city of Dundee about 900 actions that are based on consultation with local people. So we have an obligation to report to them on the progress that has been made. Okay. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. And before I start, I'd draw people's attention to my register of interest because I need to express my disappointment the North Lanarkshire Council couldn't send any representatives so long today to speak to the written submission they made. Uh, it will become clear later on in this session uh, why my disappointment is being expressed in that way. Could I ask Mr Thompson and Mr McGregor uh, directly, is Scottish Water involved in any community planning partnerships, subgroups or working groups of community planning partnerships? Um, yes, we, we are involved in some, but not all. And uh, what we um, um, took an action to do was write to all 32 council chief executives um, to uh, indicate their willingness to participate in community planning partnerships um, where appropriate, uh, if it was water related or anything to do with, with uh, uh, the Scottish water activities or a capital programme or uh, integration. Clearly, what we didn't want to do was was go along to meetings just for meeting's sake, and where we weren't going to add any value. And some local authorities have taken us up on that offer in certain areas, and uh, and, and and some haven't. So we've got a willingness to participate, but um, clearly, what we've, we've got to make sure is that we, you know, but where we attend, it's actually the areas where we've got input, and and it'll be meaningful. John? The reason for asking the question, Kinnear, is that Scottish Water, is, is, as far as I'm concerned, is crucial, particularly to some of the economic development work uh, and that's taking place throughout Scotland. Uh, and it's unfortunate that the Scottish Water aren't involved in many more uh, community planning partnerships. But the question for Ms Proctor and Mr Hosey is that would you see the community planning partnerships having an increased role and ensuring that we actually get greater community empowerment and that the community planning partnerships should be assisting communities to identify where appropriate community asset transfer should take place because the community planning partnership is an overarching role, brings together a number of different bodies uh, and do you think that, that the community planning partnership would be the appropriate body to assist communities and, as I said, take forward community asset transfers where appropriate. Ms Proctor. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think that um, to really support the in, empowerment of communities, um, we need to be looking at the opportunities for, for leadership around this at all the, the different levels that, that are available to us. I think community planning partnerships are um, a good vehicle uh, to be having that oversight of an area and a place um, and providing that direction and support for 
uh, better engagement, participation with communities. But I think their leadership role for all the organisations that sit around that partnership should ensure that all partners around the community planning uh, table are engaged also in building capacity and, and encouraging and supporting uh, engagement. So uh, it should be something that we see through all the layers from SOA down to, um, again, I'm going to bring up integration down to the locality plans that we have to develop there. So we should see that sort of engagement with communities on, on service uh, co-production expressed at all the layers from community planning down. When so you're talking to communities, do you use terms like service co-production? No. No. <laughs> well, I do. I, I think I, I, in, in, in saying that, I mean, co-production is quite a jargonistic term, isn't it? But I actually think it's a really good one. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's one that I use, but I do acknowledge that it is a, it's a jargonistic word. But I think the, the, the sentiment and philosophy underneath co-production is, 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 is really sound, because it's not about consulting people on a, a redesign that we've decided or a, or a tweak. It is about, you know, when we get underneath that, I think the, ver the very interesting thing, uh, Ms Proctor, um, and I said this the other week and it was the same last week, mm. is, you know, if you were to go out into um, communities um, and talk in the language that is being used here today and, uh, and elsewhere, you know, it's a huge turn off straight away. Of course, of course. Um, yeah. So in terms of reaching communities and getting the level of engagement that's required, I think, you know, we're going to have to rethink exactly um, uh, the use of terminology of course. Um, and get back to, to basics uh, in terms of the use of language. Mr Hosey. I mean, I, I would agree with that point uh, before I answer the question. When we did the consultation to create our last local community plans in 2012, there were some uh, issues that were raised by specifics in communities and multi-member wards. Some were city-wide, like tackling drugs misuse, like mental health and well-being. The other one that came up was keep things simple. Don't send out hundreds of leaflets full of text and jargon. Um, we need to do things differently. Um, to, go, to go back to, to answer the question, I think it's yes, that's definitely part of our core business. Uh, the, the way that the structure has evolved from Dundee with the Dundee Partnership as the Community Planning Partnership and the eight local community planning partnerships which have local people sitting on them is well placed to support groups to find a way through this maze. Uh, also some of the theme groups that exist, for example, building stronger communities, that's where community or one of the places where community asset transfer would, would be located. We have the chairs of each of the six regeneration forums in Dundee sitting on the Building Stronger Communities group. So you can't get away with jargon. It has to be pretty much factual, straight, understandable. So, and, and we, we consistently receive that message. Um, okay, John? One of the, the issues that's coming out of this bill is the, the right for communities to make an asset transfer request. I, the language that's used is that the organisations who currently own the assets or the land can take reasonable decisions not to uh, accept that asset transfer. In the panel's view, what would be seen as reasonable from your own point of view regarding refusing an asset transfer to communities? Let's start with Scottish Water. Mr Thompson or Mr McGregor? Mr McGregor. <coughs> Um, well, any request would be looked at uh, fully. Uh, obviously, um, uh, we are supportive of the bill, we reiterate. But in terms of the, the, the framework we would look at things in, we obviously have uh, sites that are operational. Um, they are effectively industrial sites where either water is being treated or wastewater treated. Um, and clearly, if they're part of our um, uh, operational infrastructure. They may not just be serving the immediate local community, but in fact a vast uh, tract of, of uh, you know, um, Scotland. So if, if a community is looking to take over that asset, that would clearly be quite a consideration for us to say, well, you know, is that really appropriate? Um, we can foresee examples, uh, not just for ourselves, but any public body where 
um, to the surrounding community, perhaps areas of ground within a site are lying unused um, and they may request, can we, can we use that? Can we uh, lease it? Can we take it over? Um, we may have, however, um, in our asset management plan, in our business plan, uh, plans for expansion of that site. So it may just be that that land is being kept on hold uh, for, for future use. Of course, um, again, we would approach this with uh, a flexible uh, mind. And if, for example, the community was willing to simply take on the use of that site for, say, five years, and we're happy that once we were ready to kick in with our investment and our expansion plan, that we take back that land, then there's no reason why we couldn't come to some uh, arrangement uh, with them. Um, I think the, 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 well, another good example will obviously be um, uh, assets which um, maybe uh, carry risks with them. I'm thinking of our impounding reservoirs, um, which you know, in some cases are close to large built-up areas. Um, Scottish Water has, in the last 12 months, taken the decision that it will not dispose of um, what we call Category A reservoirs, which, if there was some serious structural failure of the uh, dam involved, would cause, obviously, um, considerable risk to the communities downstream. Uh, we think we should retain them. We obviously have expertise in, 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 in managing reservoirs and the legislation that surrounds them. So those would be perhaps examples where we would be uh, saying, well, either we're not, uh, we're not minded to grant a long-term lease or a, an outright disposal, perhaps something more short-term would be appropriate. Okay, um, I'm not going to go into huge depth about what is a category A reservoir, but maybe you could send us some details of, of what that actually means. Sure. Um, Ms Proctor, please. Um, I would um, echo um, my, my colleague's view on this one. I, I, I believe that from an NHS Grampian Board perspective, um, every request would, would be looked at here. Um, there, there's potential possibly within the broad range of services that board delivers, that some services that there may be a request for a, a transfer aren't actually owned by the board. And I'm thinking about some primary care premises that are maybe owned or delivered by uh, GPs and independent contractors. So obviously they would not be included in, in some of that. But I think the, the um, risk-based approach that was uh, uh, talked about there is an important one. And also that when we're looking at any requests around this, there's that real focus on, on outcomes. You know, is this, is this request focusing on deliver, delivering good outcomes for that community? Uh, Mr. Hosey, please. Yeah, I, I would think as the question was about where would we uh, refuse or defer a, a request, a starting point would be to offer support to that group. I mean, the way that we have developed our outline framework for assessment, 50% weighting is given to community benefit. So we would, we would help groups who are making any request as a starting point to see what that entailed how they could evidence need, how they could consult with their own communities to ensure that there was a collective ownership. So our starting point would be positive rather than negative. It may well be that once the time, uh, and there would be support built into that in a range of ways, but by the time it came to the community asset transfer steering group, which we have in place with different council departments, uh, that we would need to risk assess it uh, in terms of governance capacity, community benefit, financial planning, where support would have been built in before that. But I guess there may be circumstances where uh, perhaps a starting point would be a short lease rather than an outright ownership, depending on capacity of a group. But we would see the starting point as being very different. OK, thank you. Stuart McMillan, please. Good morning, panel. Um, just a, a few questions uh, kind of following on from certainly uh, Alex Rowley's a few moments ago and also that previous one there. Um, but uh, to start off, uh, what discussions have you had or are you aware of within your organisations and with the trade unions regarding the bill? Uh, Ms Proctor first, please. 
I'm not aware of any discussions that uh, we've had yet with our, our staff side representatives, uh, NHS Gramp in, 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 in common with other boards in Scotland. There's a whole range of, of guidance and, and statutory relationships with our, our unions, so uh, there will be opportunities through our partnership forums to be having those discussions, but I'm not, I'm not aware. That's not to say they're not taking place, but I'm not aware of them. I would reiterate um, that I'm certainly unaware of, of, of any uh, specific discussions about the, about the bill. Could you please repeat, repeat the question? Sure. Um, what discussions uh, are you, uh, have taken place, uh, or are you aware of any discussions that have taken place uh, between uh, your organisation and the trade unions regarding the bill? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. So the, the reason for uh, for posing that is um, certainly uh, we've already heard uh, this morning uh, certainly from colleagues in terms of uh, the, the, the numbers of times where we have actually received the information or received evidence whereby um, local groups um, feel as if they actually want to contribute and they have something to contribute. Uh, but at times we've heard a lot of evidence in the past, and I've heard it certainly within the region that I represent. Uh, that they feel as if there has been a, uh, a, kind of a stonewalling uh, and it's been quite difficult for them to actually get involved. Now, this bill obviously is designed to open that up, but uh, a discussion I had with a, a senior uh, public um, uh, representative uh, some, uh, well, a couple of years ago had indicated to me that uh, if, uh, if there was a, a, kind of a, a more open approach then that would have implications upon staffing for that particular public body. And when you look at the bill, uh, certainly section 19, uh, section 19, subsection 3, uh, and uh, subsection 3C, and the various points that are there regarding to open up discussions, uh, most of the economic development, regeneration, etc. And then subsection 5, the authority must agree to the request unless there are reasonable grounds. Um, in terms of the, come back to the initial question regarding trade unions, if trade unions actually said to yourselves, or representatives said to yourselves, um, that if this were to happen, then there's a potential implication for that public authority losing staff, would you consider that to be a reasonable ground for refusing to actually enter into the discussions? Mr. Hosey? Uh, I would say no. I think we, we do live in tough economic times, um, and resources are they need to be well measured in terms of how we utilise them. In relation to this, if it's a community priority, then we need to shift our priorities to support that. Um, so, I mean, I guess that I guess the the issue of support and engagement doesn't, if it's effective, it doesn't come cheaply. It's time intensive, it's staff intensive, and there are implications for how we manage staff workloads. But that's not to say it's not a priority, and we can't look at what the priorities are and match the resources accordingly. Scottish Water, Mr Thompson. Yeah, um, I, I think that we would remain open to any uh, um, approach from, from communities. Certainly the, the, the requests that I'm aware of to date tend to be about uh, specific pieces of land or, or, or an asset that um, people maybe want to buy or, or lease, whatever. And they haven't tended to, to uh, veer into any form of, of um, consequences for, for, for staff or, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, internally to Scottish Water. But certainly engaging with third sector or, or other community groups, we remain open to that. And, and then, you know, there's, there's been a few community groups of have, have, have thought about the possibility of... A, an asset that they could maybe look to um, involve people in training and, and become water ambassadors, some of our more historic assets. So we remain open to, open to that and want to engage because if it's a better outcome for communities and, and, and assets that, that, uh, that we utilise or we no longer utilise, then it's in everybody's interest. And it's going back to the point of, of does it make common sense? And if it makes common sense for us and our customers, why, why wouldn't we do it? Um, but today, ours has tended to be uh, um, about site-specific, I would say. Ms Proctor? Um, panel will be aware that NHS terms and conditions in terms of its staff are, are, are nationally negotiated and, and, and governed by that, uh, and the whole r range of regulations would, would uh, come into force if there were significant 
change expected through the transfer of a service or an asset uh, that impacted staff. I mean, through, through our well-established partnership working with trade unions, uh, that would obviously be a, a, a key focus and they would have to be partners in that. But again, I would echo what my colleagues have said on, on the panel. I think starting with a really positive view of what, what that community group was trying to achieve through the asset transfer, um, the outcomes that we're looking to, to achieve and how we could support that, and then our, our staff side partners being, being uh, you know, key partners in, 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 in those discussions. Um, so uh, I can I can envisage uh, the, 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 the sort of service change and asset transfer that might lead to those discussions. But I think if we took a, a positive perspective that we're trying to improve outcomes, perhaps then the opportunity for a board or a public body is to ensure that within the, 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 the parameters of, of, of their staff's terms and conditions, we may be able to deliver that service in a publicly owned building. Um, but I think it's about that partnership work uh, with that positive focus on, on better outcomes for people. Okay, Mark McDonough, please. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to touch again on the issue around capacity within communities. Um, and since we've <coughs> had a number of examples raised, but the one that, that springs most readily to mind in my mind is um, two school closure campaigns or school, save our school campaigns within my constituency. One in a community uh, of uh, re in a regeneration community, one in uh, an, an affluent area uh, of, of my constituency. And, and the contrast between the approaches that were taken, the ability of one campaign to call on um, parents and, and individuals within the community who had strong professional backgrounds, you know, doctors, planners, and the other community which required a level of intensive support to put together their campaign and marshal their arguments. And, and that strikes me as being the kind of approach that is going to be commonplace as the community empowerment agenda moves forward. So what role do you see your organisation playing in those communities of most need where the, uh, the activism and enthusiasm and, uh, is undoubtedly there, but perhaps that professional expertise around things like putting together business cases um, and, and things like that doesn't exist. What, what do you see the role of your organisation being to support these communities to ensure that they can take full advantage of the legislation? Mr Hosey? I mean, where, uh, it fits neatly because the resources that we have are deployed in areas of greatest need uh, in terms of trying to, to plug the inequalities gap, which is a long-term aspiration. So where we concentrate our resources, that's a natural role for us, is to support groups who have, uh, whether it's a single issue to do with the school, although we need to be careful there because our employers are the City Council and we're talking about the Education Department. So there are levels uh, uh, in terms of how far we can go, but we can certainly support groups to campaign and point them in a direction. But that's our core business. Our core business is to build capacity in, in groups who happen to reside in areas of greatest depri deprivation. And it's negotiated. It's not always... Sometimes it's about the balance between challenge and support. Sometimes we have to challenge groups to see things slightly differently whilst we support them along that journey. So it's our core business. Ms Proctor. Um, I think in, in many of the responses that, that committees uh, re received, that, that's been noted as a, an area of, of risk and concern, um, that we see well-placed communities with a lot of natural resources uh, become very involved in this and, and seize the opportunities. And those perhaps that don't have the capacity, the capability, and who have not uh, encouraged that lose the, the opportunity. I think there's a role for the community planning partnerships in their place shaping work around that to identify. Obviously, a board's role is, is supporting and understanding around where our communities of deprivation are. And sometimes they'll be geographically placed, but I think a board has a, a role and public bodies have a role in understanding our deprived communities of interest and groups that perhaps are disadvantaged as well as communities that are disadvantaged and ensure that, that they're able to, to participate in this as well. Again, I think the, the focus on locality working, really down at the level of our, our, our GP practices, our teams, our social workers, our third sector uh, partners around that, um, working in, in those communities, building on work that's already happening there with, with a focus on, on this. Okay, Mr McGregor. 
Um, my uh, area of expertise is obviously um, asset disposals and, <coughs> and transfers, and um, Scottish Water's um, actually been very proactive in working with groups who have aspirations, particularly to take over some of our underused or unused assets. And we have an example of uh, one in Dundee, actually, where a group for several years has had aspirations to take over a, a historic building. Um, they have had um, capacity and capability issues, and rather than we could have, you know, this is obviously pre-community impairment bill, but we could have um, walked away, um, ignored them, and just said, you know, you don't have a business plan. We've actually been very um, proactive in engaging with the, the um, um, uh, Dundee City Council. Um, they obviously have experience of working. Uh, with community groups in in the city, um, this this group is going to rely on some watery funding. Uh, again, they were struggling to put together some of the the business case requirements to support a watery bid. The, the council again had previous experience of similar community projects in the city, so it was one where we were obviously being a facilitator, really, as well as the asset owner. In, in, in bringing forward um, the right package of information that would help them take it forward. And it, I'm pleased to say it looks like it's, it, it's going to come to an outcome, which is you know, in, in keeping with what we're hoping to do as asset owners and the uh, community group's um, aspirations. One, one of the things that um, I've experienced in um, um, microphone, sorry. please, because I can't sorry. hear anyway. <laughs> what, what, one of the other things which I've experienced in, in my constituency um, is that there are examples out there of very good uh, examples of community empowerment that have occurred without the legislation being in place. I think the legislation is necessary because these are often exceptions rather than rules. But where you as organisations have had positive experiences in terms of communities uh, you know, taking on assets or, or uh, becoming more, more involved in how things operate. Um, do you see there being a role in terms of connecting up communities as well, so that those communities that have had those positive experiences that are doing good things uh, can be put in con easy contact with other communities? Because we're, we're, we're often bad at sharing best practice across Scotland. We're actually also very bad at doing it across local authority or, or, or small community jumps between areas. Do you think that there's a role for your organisations in making sure that communities are better connected in that way? We're now going against the clock, so brief answers if possible, please, Ms Proctor. Yes, I think that, that, that notion of sharing best practice so that communities who are actually involved in this and who've got experience of, of something that's, that's, that's difficult and challenging and new uh, can work with places that have, have been through this and have uh, experienced some of the pitfalls and challenges so that they're, they're not, not repeating that. So a network where uh, communities can be supported in that and organisations such as the, the, the one I represent can also be supported in this would be welcome. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, I, yeah, I, f I firmly agree with your, your point. Um, uh, um, I think that we we can learn um, to exchange best practice and some of the things that went right and some of the things that didn't go right. An example of that would be for us was major planning applications were at, at Catherine, where the uh, uh, Catherine oh, yeah, water, uh, water treatment works in, in, in Glasgow. Big application, a, a lot of considerations of the community and and planning gain, all sorts of things. We took a lot of the learning from that and our uh, uh, water treatment works, major water treatment works outside Edinburgh at Glen Course. We, we then said, well, what's all the learnings? And we encouraged you know, the community groups and the councillors to, to exchange that information between groups so that we could get a better outcome. And that's what happened in the Glen Course. We got plan application for that within uh, 10 months. And, and some of that was actually about what, what didn't go so well in the first one. I think, if I may, on, on the community, that one of the other aspects that does strike me when I, I go around the country and speaking to communities um, is that if there is good ideas that somebody comes forward with, the early engagement is really important, but you can actually sometimes, if you don't think it's going to happen, you're as well saying to the community right from the beginning because if you set aspirations off and then they form groups and one thing and another and then it comes back and answers was, was a no, at, at least a lot of negativity. So good, concise, early information to communities 
is actually you know in benefit if you don't believe it's going to happen in the, in, in the longer term and being open and honest with, with people right from the off. Mr Hosey, please. Uh, very briefly, two examples. One, we have regeneration forums in six of the eight wards in Dundee where there is great deprivation. These are forums which elect 15 local people to make decisions about funding allocations. They come together every month as chairs to meet and share with a common agenda and they find that very valuable. I mean, overall, we get that feedback from people across the city that they would like to create opportunities to meet with people in different parts of the city. As a result of that, the Dundee Partnership run a community conference every six months. Now, that's not for professionals, it's not for elected members, it's for local people who sit on community councils, structures, housing, youth groups, whatever. The agenda is theirs, it's not ours. So we've had a, a range of very successful conferences in the centre of Dundee on a Saturday morning when it suits people to, to, to talk about welfare reform, asset transfer, tackling poverty, and the feedback we get from that is very positive in terms of the connections that are made. Okay, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you. Um, I'm particularly interested in this asset transfer, which you've just mentioned. Um, do you have a register of your assets? And also, um, are they available to the public? And furthermore, is there an appeals process if somebody doesn't agree with your, the transfer? Like you mentioned, there was a short lease, for example, you said. That. Is, do you have an appeals process in, in place for that? I'm going to caveat uh, Cameron's question there by saying, do you have a full and comprehensive asset <laughs> register? <laughs> Mr Hosey. We share it also through, we've just agreed to share it through the local community planning partnerships. So we're doing as much as we can to raise awareness of the opportunities that are currently available. In relation to appeals process, we do not have that. We're in the early stages of implementing this strategy and we'd seek advice as appropriate in relation to that. Mr McGregor. Yeah. Yes, we, we have a, 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 uh, an asset register of uh, all our operational and non-operational assets. Is it full and comprehensive? Uh, I don't think any organisation could um, be absolutely sure, given the, especially a nationwide one like us, that they have everything because we have inherited assets from predecessor organisations. It always it's, amazes uh, me this, because I can everything that I own. <laughs> yeah. Well. Certainly all our key <laughs> assets, yeah. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of assets on the asset register. Um, Ms Proctor. The board has a property and asset management strategy that it's required to, to compile and publish, so it's, it's, it's available. Uh, and my understanding of that property and asset management strategy is that includes the physical assets, their condition. It's um, got a strategy, but does it actually have a yes. full and comprehensive yes, register? it does, yes. It does? Yes, and it's required to be published. All boards have one. OK, that's interesting, because I think previously NHS Grampian struggled in that regard. Um, Could I just ask, yeah. do you think an asset, um, an appeals mechanism is relevant? Do you think we should have an appeals mechanism for the, for the asset transfer? Briefly, Ms Proctor. I think there should always be uh, an opportunity for um, a... Um, an, an appeal. I'm perhaps not um, the expert in this particular area of physical asset transfer, uh, but uh, appeals would seem to be reasonable if they are proportionate. Uh, Mr McGregor. Yes, uh, I would say so. Um, there is going to be an element, uh, as I said earlier, of judgment call in assessing some of these requests. Uh, and you know, we may not always get the judgment right, uh, and thus it's, it's fair that um, it does go to an appeal. Mr Hosey? Uh, I would agree. I, I think the question is who and where that appeal process sits. If you're very brief, Mr McMillan, but you have to be very brief. It is very brief. It's mainly aimed to, towards Scottish Water. Do you have any outstanding uh, legal issues regarding asset transfers from other public authorities to yourself? Mr McGregor? Um, one or two um, which emerged from the, the separation of the, the uh, water and drainage functions from um, council bodies. They, are not, they do not in any way uh, impact on our operations. It's purely uh, separation of legal titles. 
Okay, thank you very much for your evidence today. I recognise that that's a, a pretty uh, long session. Thank you. Um, I suspend uh, and uh, we'll have a change of witnesses. Thank you.
Um, uh, we now move on to our second panel this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome John Glover, uh, Scotland Community Land Advisor for the Community Land Advisory Service, uh, Martin Doherty, Policy Advisor, Volunteer Scotland, Robin Parker, Public Affairs Office, Bernardo Scotland, Maggie Patterson, Chair of the Community Learning and Development Managers Scotland, and Linda Gillespie, Programme Manager, Development Trusts Association Scotland. You're all very, very welcome indeed. Uh, do any of you wish to make any opening statement? Mr Parker. Uh, I'll take the offer since it's been offered. Thank you, Convener, and thank you for the opportunity to, to present to the committee. Um, as an organisation, uh, we, we welcome the fact that there is a community empowerment bill on the table, and I think that's because uh, we recognise from our own work that um, communities that are more connected, more empowered, are, that are more in control uh, of their future, their destiny in the local area, um, they experience better outcomes. So we, sh we should have a community empowerment bill. I think um, we see some merit in each part of the bill as it's set out, um, but our concern or the way that we want to judge this bill is... Um, is really the balance that it achieves between further empowering already empowered communities or whether it tips the balance so that those communities that are most disempowered that experience the most significant inequalities in Scotland, uh, whether every community can benefit from, from the measures in the bill. Um, and I think our view on that at the moment as things stand is that we think there are ways that the bill can be strengthened um, and we've worked with a number of other organisations um, and if, if, it, if those, some of those things can be picked up and it can be strengthened then I think the bill can do more to um, tackle some of those deep inequalities that Scotland has. Thank you. Anyone else wish to uh, make any statement? Mr Doherty. Thank you Chair. Again along with Robin, thank you for the opportunity. One of our gravest concerns is the lack of mention of the individual, the volunteer that seeks to empower both the community and uh, the, in terms of thematic communities and geographic communities. And we have grave concerns uh, about that and we're looking for the opportunity to promote the, the idea of improvements in the national performance framework, that there should be some recognition of the impact of volunteering across the national performance framework to ensure that outcomes uh, which are related to volunteering can be properly measured to enhance our knowledge of volunteering and critically its role within our community. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms Gillespie. Um, I just have a, a kind of point of clarification. Although I'm a, its programme manager of the Development Trust Association, I'm actually the programme manager for the Community Ownership Support Service, which operates out of the Development Trust Association. Thank you. I think that's very useful for us indeed. Um, anyone else? No, OK. Um, thank you uh, for those opening statements. Um, Mr Parker gave us a, a brief overview of why he thinks the powers are, are necessary. Um, I wonder if, if you could tell us why you think these powers are necessary and whether you think public bodies um, are ready to, to deal with these new powers. Uh, if we could start with Mr Gillespie, please. Um, I, 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 we very much welcome the Community Empowerment um, Bill and absolutely see as it being necessary to, to make the process easier, to actually genuinely make it easier across all public bodies. Clearly local authorities have the power at the moment to transfer and this, this will kind of enshrine it across the whole public sector. Okay. Uh, Mr Glover. Um, yes, I, I thank, thank, thank you for the invitation to speak to the committee. Um, I believe that the, the powers are useful and necessary. Um, and <clears throat> one particular point from my, my particular role <clears throat> is that I'm as much involved in brokering temporary community use of assets as in per permanent transfers of assets. And from that point of view, <clears throat> I, I, see, I see it very welcome that the, the asset transfer request provisions don't just speak about ownership or leases, but they also speak about management and use. <clears throat> and one reason I think that's important is I agree with what the government say in the policy memorandum about that, that all, not all communities are ready to take on ownership. But the, another reason I'm very much in favour of that is that it brings in potentially a lot more land. It's not just about the nature of the communities, but it's about the nature of the land. Uh, this is touched on in the earlier session, that if, um, if land is earmarked for a different use in the long term, it should nonetheless be made available to the community in the short term. And there are some good, there are some good practice examples of that going on at the moment. But it's also, 
It's also very evident that a lot of land which could be being used by communities has a fence around it and is lying vacant. So I very much support the, the way that these provisions will encourage meanwhile use of land. Um, are, are public authorities ready? Um, I, think, I think not. There are, again, there's good, there are good practice examples. Um, the Glasgow Council Stalled Spaces Scheme you know, is, a, is a, a good practice example, which is now being promoted across the rest of Scotland. Um, there have been successful community interactions with, with various, various land, landowners, but my own impression is that more work needs to be done to, to get public authorities into a mindset where it's second nature to make, to make land available to communities. Ms Patterson, please. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, Community Learning Development Managers Scotland, welcome the opportunity to come and give evidence this morning and also welcome uh, the bill. We have membership from across all 32 local authorities and I would certainly agree with the um, statement within the policy memorandum that the actual experience and, and progress towards community engagement and community empowerment differs uh, and varies considerably uh, across Scotland. So we certainly welcome the bill as um, helping to, to reduce that incon inconsistency. In terms of... Uh, uh, readiness uh, for the Community Empowerment Bill certainly would see that as varying. Um, a number of communities are, are very strong. Uh, they are aware of themselves as assets and uh, aware of themselves as able to make a, an important uh, contribution. Other communities uh, would very much need uh, support uh, to be able to take advantage uh, of the uh, uh, the rights that are being offered uh, through the bill and I think that applies to public authorities as well that some have um, um, experience and practice that's very much in, in line with the, the bill already and already empowers and engages communities but that, that varies and, and uh, the practice is not consistent. Mr Parker. Yeah, just adding to what, what I said uh, in my opening remarks to speak particularly I think really around um, part three of the bill um, I think one of the things that this bill will enable to happen is for us to realise much more that um, participation and particularly kind of involvement in decision making, uh, it really is a right, it's a right of communities. It's not, I think it, the way things exist at the moment, it's understood as, as best practice. It's something that um, most public bodies um, endeavour to do, I think by and large, is to involve people in decision making. But I think what part three um, or something like part three can help create is a situation where um, a community can turn around and say, no, it, it's our right to be involved in this decision. We, we think we've got something to bring to it. We want to be involved in that um, decision-making process. Um, and in, and um, particularly from our point of view as a children's organisation, um, involvement in decisions that are relevant to a young person is one of the rights that are established in um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, something which uh, ministers now have to take take into account and they have a duty to take into account as a, re as a result of the Children and Young People's um, Act, uh, which was recently passed. Um, I think the other thing I'd say just around why the, why the bill is needed, um, I, think, um, some pe I think some people have said that um, the legislation can't do it all, and I think that's absolutely right and something we agree with. There is an element of capacity building and so on that needs, needs to take place to go al alongside what's in the, in the Act. Um, but I think what the legislation can bring is, firstly, it can, um, I think, if the community planning partnership section is strengthened, it can make sure that um, uh, community empowerment is seen as one of the purposes of public bodies. Um, if, that, if that section is, is strengthened, as, as we outlined in our written submission. Um, and then secondly, I think the reality is that public bodies hold a lot of power in Scotland. Um, that is quite rightly um, through democratic processes in part. Local authorities have elected members and so on. Um, but one of the things that I think this bill can do is make sure that we hand over some, some of that power and we uh, involve on a day-to-day -day basis our communities um, in the decision makings uh, of public bodies because people who use, the people who use public services are the experts above all others in how those uh, public services can be improved. Thank you. Before I take him, uh, Mr. Doherty, um, the participation of the requests which you have, uh, have mentioned, uh, Mr. Parker, the, the draft bill 
um, states that uh, an organisation who is requesting uh, a participation request uh, has to be a, a constituted body. Now, let me um, throw something at you here. One of the things which uh, we know there have been difficult difficulties round about um, where we have legislated just recently to improve is, is round about care leavers. Um, how do you see a, a group of care leavers, for example, getting together to challenge and to put forward a public uh, a, a participation request to a public body to improve the services that they get? I'm, I'm really pleased that you use, use that example because, well, firstly, we work very closely with care leavers, but secondly, it's one of the examples that we've been thinking through in our heads. Um, and right when uh, the Scottish Government's consulted a number of times on this bill, um, it, it, when it, before it reached the, the Parliament, um, and one of the, the first instances where, where there was a consultation that took place, one of the things that we said very strongly, thinking about um, examples like, like your own uh, very much, was that we were keen that this bill supported communities of interest as well as geographic communities in this case. Um, and that one of the things that we're very pleased is that um, the bill does reflect that. Um, I think in terms of the, the constant how um, the, the fact that uh, communities have to be constituted, as you say, I think one of the things that we'd very much welcome clarification um, from the government on, um, and perhaps the, the committee can help with that, is uh, how constituted um, they see that as, as needing to be and meaning to be, um, and whether that's something that um, needs to be brought out more on the face of the bill or through guidance. Um, we'd like to see that to be a very it, it, very flexible in how it's how it's applied, and that um, it wouldn't need to be a very formally constituted group, uh, if you see what I mean. Thanks. The the draft bill it seems to be pretty loose, but you know I think clarification there is probably required. Uh, Mr. Doherty, you talked about individuals, and obviously um, volunteers often work on an individual basis. So again, similar to to Mr. Parker there, um, that that constitutional aspect maybe poses some difficulties in that regard. But are there also opportunities there in terms of volunteers getting together to try and increase the influence uh, that, they, that they have in terms of participation? Uh, there's an op there's a, there would be an opportunity if we were in a flat line in volunteering. We have been at a flat line in volunteering, formal volunteering rates for nearly a decade in this country. And the Scottish Household Survey substantiates that. I mean, if you want, I can maybe give you some instances of your your own locations in areas that you might cover. Um, Chair, I know that you uh, and Ms McDonald will cover Aberdeen City, so we've seen from 2007 it drop from 33% down to 27%. It might not seem substantial, but in terms of relative volunteering and the inequality of volunteering, it can be. If we take uh, East Lothian, uh, covering the regions of Lothian, uh, we'll take from 37% um, down to 32% in formal volunteering. Fife has fallen, well, it's actually it's went up in Fife. It's one of those ones that's went up from 22 to 28%. Uh, we then have Glasgow. Um, it follows many of its own indicators from 25 down to 24. Inverclyde from 29 to 24. North Lanarkshire from 24 to 21. And West Lothian from 29 to 26. And the reason I mention it is our challenge for us as a national body for volunteering, but also to policymakers, is how do we stop this? Because if you don't have at least some form of stabilisation or increase in identifying as a volunteer, then we don't have an empowered community. And that, for us, is ringing alarm bells across this bill, but also across a range of other policy agendas from health and social care integration, which rely heavily on volunteering activity. Uh, so there are grave concerns. We think there's opportunities, uh, but there needs to be a wee bit of clarity. Um, you've opened up a can of worms here. Oh, it's it my two intention, Chair. Two, two, <laughs> two supplementaries in a second. Um, but before, before I take in uh, Mark MacDonald and Alec Rowley, um, one of the things which the committee heard uh, when it recently visited um, the Western Isles um, was that the Western Isles, that's me. Almost all in the community there do some form of volunteering, mm -hmm. but they don't actually see it as being volunteering. Yeah. Are some of the statistics that you have given us, quite possibly, because they are from the Scottish Household Survey, as you rightly said, is it maybe the case that some of the folks um, who answered the questions in that didn't realise that they were actually volunteering? There, there is an element of that. I mean, there, 
whilst they're, they're, the original 19, 2007 was around about 30,000 people participated in the survey. It has slightly fallen, but the methodology has greatly improved. Uh, therefore, I'm, I, I'm certainly not going to call into question the SHS because I think it's a very robust piece of work and it's at this moment in time the only piece of work that we have. Um, and we at Volunteering Scotland are actually trying to work uh, with the team who deal with the Scottish Household Survey to try and improve the question. And we would certainly like to in this debate with them the idea of informal volunteering. In terms, in terms of Ellen Sayre, the Western Isles, it's 57% recognised formal volunteering. Now, that has pockets of deprivation, um, but it's a very uh, rural community, more rural than the Highlands, uh, an island community, but that speaks volumes about the opportunities, because if you're, say, at the top of uh, the Western Isles and you need someone to forgive, me giving this kind of example, but you know, the NHS need someone to clip your toenails and you can't reach your toes, you'll get someone from Stornoway to come and do it for you, who's a volunteer. Uh, Mark MacDonald, on that point. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm interested in the, in the statistics, and I think that, obviously, as you say, the, the, the SHS is, is, is all that we have to go on, but I would be interested to know from your experiences and from your discussions with, with voluntary sector partners around Scotland, how that then... Uh, is replicated in communities within these areas because obviously many of these local authority areas will have areas of, of deprivation and areas of affluence and it would be interesting to know if those who are volunteering are more likely to do so in areas of affluence than areas of deprivation or indeed vice versa. I can answer that the, the link between deprivation and volunteering low levels is very clear. Uh, high areas of deprivation will have low levels of volunteering. Uh, there's issues around social capacity, uh, social networking, and I use that in the broadest sense. Um, in terms of skills levels, uh, you, you, Ms McDonald mentioned earlier on about communities sharing skills. You will find in very highly deprived communities a lot of skill. It's the opportunity to use that skill and to be listened to. Um, I, I maybe briefly, Chair, just give you the example that in the last 10 years we've seen substantial investment in the third sector. For those of us that are volunteering in Scotland, this is not about the third sector. This is about all sectors, both private and public, who all use volunteers. And, you know, you've just had the NHS sitting here, didn't hear them mentioning volunteers. You had Scottish Water, they, they use volunteers at some of the reservoirs. The local authority, they talk about asset portfolios. I'd be interested to know if they actually list their volunteers that they all use, and some of them don't even know how many volunteers they have in their asset portfolios. That would be very interesting. Uh, Alec, please. Yeah, I mean, I'm pleased to hear the figures in Fife. One of the criticisms I've made in Fife over a number of years is that the council was pretty poor at actually engaging with third sector organisations, and we tend to associate volunteering with that, although you've pointed out that's perhaps not the right way to do it. But so in the terms of this bill, how do you see this bill actually um, supporting more people getting involved, more people at a voluntary level getting involved? Do you, you know, what, what, what's in here that's good, but more importantly, what do you think needs to be in there? The bill itself for us as a national body is a step forward. Uh, the practicalities, as we were told, that this is very much a, f a, a formal bill. It's about a practical implication of a piece of legislation. If one of the major things we would like to see in, in terms of the recommendations that we've made in our submission is early involvement. You talked earlier on to the public bodies about uh, you know, community bodies. Well, get the community bodies in before you decide what an appeals process is. Get the community bodies in to design the, help you design the actual process for application for an asset transfer. So involve individual volunteering organisations in the design of those local approaches to your community asset transfer. That would be a practical step forward. Okay. I don't know, I want to, to, to stay on volunteering all the time, but I think there's one key thing that we, we need to know from you, Mr Doherty, before um, I bring in other folks. In terms of um, the UK government's welfare reform policies, um, and uh, somehow, uh, in some places, it seems that folk are feared to go and volunteer now in case they, they lose benefit. Has that had an effect on the numbers of volunteers, particularly um, in our more deprived communities? There's anecdotal evidence 
that third sector interfaces, and I'm aware, Chair, that you don't like jargon, but uh, the third sector interfaces of the old CVSs, volunteer centres and social enterprise, there's anecdotal evidence from them that they are seeing increased numbers. We would need to get those numbers from them specifically, because uh, it's difficult to get a hold of. But what I would say is that we are starting to work very closely, not just with Voluntary Action Scotland, but also the Department of Work and Pensions, to try and mitigate as much as possible the impact for vol potential volunteers, so that they're given the right resources, they're, the right, they're, they are signposted in the right direction, and it's not just, I'm here because I've been told to. I just wanted to chip in uh, very briefly on Mr Rowley's um, question. Um, and one of the things that um, we think that could help with um, this in terms of bringing groups together um, in terms of the, the bill is, so in the participatory request section, um, if you have a, a group of people who come forward and who aren't yet constituted, um, I think, you know, hopefully most local authorities would, would turn around and provide them with support and assistance to, to help them become um, constituted and fulfil all the requirements. Um, but something in the bill that, that proofed that and made, made sure there was a bit of a, a duty in some way um, for the public body to um, support that group to come together and be able to make something like a participation request um, would, would be a beneficial addition. OK, thank you. And McTaggart, please. Thank you, Rina, and welcome to the panel. Um, got a few questions. Sorry, I might just be dotting all over the place here. But my first one is to Ms Patterson. The, you, uh, in your submission to the committee, you spoke about um, direct. The bill does not directly facilitate community empowerment. Now, throughout a lot of your submissions, you talk about national standards. Can you give me how they co correlate and how they could work together? Ms. Um, Patterson. <clears throat> I'm assuming you're talking about the national standards for community engagement yes. and ha ha Sorry, how yes. that works. I think in terms of, of saying that it doesn't in, in, in of it itself is the, uh, the uh, aspect of actually sharing or um, the, the um, uh, joint uh, power that the, the bill uh, still uh, gives the community planning partnership or the public um, um, authority that the, the the position of responding to a request uh, rather than uh, the, uh, that's something that is, is, is participated in. I think in, in agreeing with uh, Martin in as much as uh, the process for participation is one that's decided by the, uh, the public body. So I think in the standards for community engagement, it talks, as we heard earlier, about uh, communities being involved at a very early stage at the outset and that it's clear what that uh, process of engagement uh, would, would be and uh, that uh, it's clear what's actually there for, for discussion. So I think that's the kind of thing that, that we mean when, when talking about uh, progressing empowerment and, and talking about, about standards. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, a lot of... To what extent um, are the community bodies... Do they have the capacity? Because we've heard a lot of evidence that the less deprived communities, of course, will, will kind of suffer from uh, within this bill. Um, what will your bodies be doing? What will your organisations be doing to combat that? Mm -hmm. well, to, to Anne's question there, because obviously you represent the National Body of Community Learning and Development Manager Scotland, and we know as a committee, have, having visited many places, that in some areas there's good practice and there's interventions with deprived communities which help build that capacity, and in other areas that's flat. How does your organisation itself and the folks who you represent ensure that that best practice is exported across the country? The, one of the key purposes of the Community Land Development Manager Scotland is to bring the Community Land and Development workforce together to share that practice so that, that in my area I become aware of the, the good practice in, in your area and that I become aware of the issues, uh, etc., that, that people are facing and also learn from others' experience in overcoming some of the barriers uh, that there are there. So that would be the way that we do it. As committee will be aware, there is the CLD regulation uh, 
from uh, 2013, and a, a key aspect of that is about identifying communities' needs for, com for community learning and development. And across the membership at the moment, that's a key focus that we have. We'd be supporting our, our partners and encouraging our, our uh, membership to uh, use that uh, regulation as a way of identifying need among a, a range of communities. So indeed, the, the, the need for support in one community might, might differ from another, but the regulation requires um, authorities to uh, identify need and indeed to also uh, explain why certain needs are not uh, being met. So as an organisation, we'd be encouraging our membership to be aware of the implications of the bill, to be aware of uh, where we can play a role in supporting this uh, uh, identification of need for community learning and development for, for capacity in this case to uh, 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 you know for people to access their rights um, under under the bill so as an organization that's very much about our, our whole purpose is to share practice but also to try and support the implementation of um, uh, pieces of legislation like the CLD regulation and like the community empowerment bill when it becomes uh, enacted Anna, yeah. It's me. Thank, thanks, okay. Convener. Uh, Mark McDonald, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, so I asked the last panel around the issue of community capacity and obviously the the difference between the affluent and the and the deprived communities and the level of support that they're likely to require. Because while there is, I think I, I don't think there is any community that is without capacity and without uh, ability within the community. It's how that is channeled, harnessed, and supported. Do you think that we need to identify somebody whose job it is to support these communities at the risk of it then, uh, that it, if we don't, it becomes nobody's job? Ms Gillespie, shall we start with you, please? Mm. Sorry, yes, you just speech for the water. Beg your pardon. <laughs> um, um, our experience, Community Ownership Support Service, is just under 400 inquiries coming through. Your point about affluent communities and less affluent communities is, is well made. Affluent communities get through very quickly. They have access to mixed skills within their communities. They speak the language of the public sector. They speak the language of funders as well. Um, where, in general, we have found that communities are reacting to threat and opportunity. So it's the threat of closure or it's an opportunity emerges. So. In, in less affluent communities, exactly the same ap applies. Now, we, through our work with local authorities, we have costed the asset transfer strategies, and it's an internal document. And broadly, if you were to access grant funding to help you through the process, it's in the region of about £20,000 £25,000. If you have access to skills in your community, you can deliver go through an asset transfer process with just accessing the professional services you need for about 12 or 13. So there is also a financial element in terms of straight support for less affluent communities, um, where more affluent communities just get through the process. Mr Glover. Um, I very much agree with everything that Linda's just said. The, it's certainly... The message that came from the previous panel is also one that I hear from the network that I'm in, that more disadvantaged communities do need more support. Um, <clears throat> the, I agree with Linda's point about language, both in terms of officialdom and also trying to understand something like the Community Empowerment Bill. It's, you know, it's, not, it's not an easy read for someone who's not used to, to dealing with legislation. Um, the, in dealing with local authorities, I mean, something which I know a lot of groups have difficulty with is just finding the right person to speak to in local authorities. So I'm very much an enthusiast for the idea of there being a, a named officer in a, in a local authority who communities can engage with. Within my remit, I mean, all, all local authorities have, have a, an allotments officer, and that's often the person that the groups I deal with are interested in. But... What, what I find is that the, there isn't consistency across the 32 local authorities as to whether it's the state's department, the parks department. If, you, if a community wants to take on a bit of land, there's, it's not consistent who you, 
who in a council you speak to to try and get places. Councils, Mr Glover, but obviously this bill covers other public bodies too. Do you think the other public bodies should also have named officers in this regard? I think those, certainly those who are major landholders, um, the, I would support, the, for, for instance, Scottish Water and NHS trusts should, should have named contact. I'm not sure if it's so relevant for some of the more minor bodies. OK, thank you. Ms Patterson. In terms of the, the uh, participation request, I think the, the, the legislation itself is, is, is quite difficult to assess and, and would be particularly difficult for the less affluent uh, communities. Uh, and I think that another difficulty with that and that it makes, creates a barrier for uh, less affluent communities, if that's what we're calling them, is the, is the process itself. While the participation request um, allows me the, the uh, right to say, can I participate in your process? If that process itself is also quite complicated and inaccessible, having the right to participate in it is, um, uh, is only one step forward. I, I may also need support to, to, to um, um, access the process and to take advantage um, of the, the the process. So I think, and I think that is particularly uh, difficult for uh, less affluent and uh, less affluent uh, communities. For example, the legislation would require me, if I had a, a concern about the process that you had um, outlined for me to, to participate, then I have to put that concern in writing uh, to you. So that's a, a barrier for me uh, uh, from from the start. So I think it is is a, 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 a barrier for some, some communities and, and yes, it, there is a, a disadvantage there. Is that not where your members come in in terms of helping um, some folk? And I'm, I'm keen to stress that, you know, although we're talking about affluent and less affluent uh, communities, mm -hmm. in some of the less afflu affluent communities, we have folks who are equally, if not more, articulate and capable than those folks in affluent communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I said that that's the terminology that's being used, but that, that is certainly the case. There are some, you know, the uh, capacity of communities varies not only in relation to their, their affluence, but nonetheless, there are some communities who would find it difficult to um, access their, their rights and, and do need support. And yes, that is the, the, the purpose of our organisation, is to support our membership, to, to give the best best quality uh, support and the best informed and, and directed support uh, as they can. Clearly, uh, resources are limited across our membership and across other public authorities as well to, to do that. Mr Parker, please. Um, so absolutely agreeing with your point there, Kamina, in terms of one of the things we did um, when we were looking at the Scottish Government's last consultation on, on this um, bill over Christmas time, um, we did we put together with some of our frontline staff things that, um, from our experience on, on kind of frontline working staff of what matters in community empowerment, one of them was always taking a strengths-based approach and recognising the assets that already exist in a community. But I think, um, as I think Mr Macdonald said to the previous panel, sometimes it's a particular kind of expertise that's needed, particularly perhaps for some of the, um, uh, um, I think the provisions later on in the bill, so some of the asset transfer ones that probably as an organisation we're less familiar with, it's, it's those kind of things that you need in order to take those up. Um, speaking specifically to the participation request um, uh, provision, which is the one, of, uh, one that we felt we had more expertise to be able to um, uh, provide our, our experience on. Um, I think one of the things, there is something that is, is missing from that section in terms of um, a, a duty on the, on the public body to um, support any, any kind of group coming forward to, to go through that process. I think I'm caricaturing it a bit, that section, but that section at the moment reads a little bit like um, there is an opportunity for you as a community group to come forward to ask things to say you would like to, but all the decision making still in that section is is on the public body side of things. Um, and that's one of the reasons in, in the work that we did together with Oxfam and Poverty Alliance, we thought that that section, one of the things that section absolutely needed was some sort of appeal mechanism that, that made sure it wasn't just the public body that decided how that process uh, went about. Um, and the, the last thing I think I'd say, um, I, I don't think you can have, well, it, uh, building a specific person in, into a bill um, is maybe something that's a bit more difficult, but I think something that could certainly happen is something that made it clear to um, public bodies that um, 
community empowerment was part of their purpose um, would be really beneficial. Um, and making it clear which organisation that does that. I think one of the things that, that Maggie mentioned, the, nas the national standards for community uh, engagement, putting that onto a statutory basis as part of this bill would really, really help with that because I think that would send... Um, consultation is, is by and large, there's a lot of really good consultation that takes place by public bodies. But what the national, putting the national standards onto a statutory basis would do is make it clear that it should always be high, high quality, uh, genuine um, uh, involvement that takes place. Chair, I'd like to back up what Maggie and Robin have said, uh, first of all, in terms of a uh, named person really should be a strategic element of every local authority, community planning partnership, every NHS board, to have this as part of their vision about how they involve either individuals through volunteering or community volunteering involving organisations. Uh, the idea that we should have another named person on top of 32 local authorities, 15 health boards, I can't remember how many special boards we have, all the other various public bodies, uh, I, I don't think would be a benefit to anybody but there should be an enforcement in all public bodies to be fully cognizant of what the powers of this bill are, what it means for them, and how it is carried out in their actual physical day-to-day -day activity. So when someone's picking up the phone and someone makes a request about an asset transfer, they think, oh, I know what that's about. Uh, and it does relate to me because my organisation wants to empower communities, wants to make them healthier, wants to make them more sustainable and more resilient. So it really is about making sure it's in the culture of these organisations not necessarily about naming specific individuals. In terms of the participation request, again, I'm backing up Maggie, if you don't involve communities and individuals at the beginning, you might as well not bother. If you want to design a participation request, design it around the people who need it, and that's the local communities. That would be my advice uh, if you're taking any element of that forward, because the more you do to empower them at that early stage, the less problems you have down the line in terms of governance processes, and you have more tangible outcomes. And that's why we would really like to see a national performance framework, something in terms of volunteering. Mark? M maybe I can crystallise this a little bit further with an example. So before I got involved in elected politics, I was involved in a, a, a group of um, sports clubs who had come together with a view to uh, taking on an area of land with the view to developing a sporting facility. The convener will be uh, familiar with this. Um, and <laughs> what happened was that because the land was held by the local authority, there was a view from local authority officers that they did not want to be seen to be too uh, involved in terms of support for business case, grant application, etc., because they would then have a role to play in terms of asset disposal, asset transfer. And that led to the group falling into the trap that many groups fall into of self-proclaimed experts in how to get funding, how to approach things, attaching themselves to the group and offering poor advice, which led to things not really moving forward at all, and lo and behold, nothing has happened. So I guess my view would be where that vacuum exists, and it, and it will undoubtedly exist where there will be a view that there is perhaps a conflict of interest for a body to be uh, too involved in the support for a community uh, initiative, because it will have a role to play in terms of the transfer of an asset. Should we have more... Uh, more robust guidance perhaps in place around who communities can go to um, and who uh, and for those public bodies to be in a position to advise communities we cannot be the ones to deal with this uh, in terms of the support you need but here are the people you should go to the people who can give you that advice and give you that support to avoid those kind of scenarios from arising a very long question i'd appreciate briefer answers please if possible uh, mr doherty we'll start with you this time Talk, to me, talk about me opening a can of worms. Um, so Mr. Donna, what I would say, Chair, is that it opens up uh, various issues for community groups and also I recognise for public bodies, such as cost implications. And nevertheless, there has been substantial investment, both this administration and previous administrations, in third sector support for this type of approach. Um, so my approach would be more about how do we collaborate? You know, how are we working together on the 32 community planning partnerships in this country to make sure that these groups are actually supported? There is a substantial amount of work undertaken in the community planning partnerships of Scotland. And it needs, they need to recognise a better collaborative approach to make sure that communities are involved, supported, and there is a, a lesser nature of duplication. And, and critically, in terms of uh, public bodies who might feel... Uh, off-put about being involved in that, that element of support during a community transfer. Um, openness and transparency 
might be the way to tackle that. And if they're open and transparent, I can't imagine there'd be any reason why they wouldn't want to support a community group of which they're supportive of. So there's a certain amount of risk aversity in duplication, you would say? I would, I would have said so. Yeah. Yeah. Ms Gillespie. Um, I, I think that's a very interesting example, actually. And I would, I would say maybe in the last year, there's been a, quite a shift. And, and I know most of my examples are based on local authorities. But you know, certainly more than half of Scotland's local authorities now have asset transfer strategies in place with the decision making through different groups. And you've got you've got very good practice in places like East Ayrshire, which have you know brought together teams of officers to support community groups through asset transfer. And they're quite different from the decision making within the council. And then you've got the South Lanarkshire approach, which is about bringing together the external bodies mentioned and bringing them together to support the, the community groups going through asset transfer. So it, it is beginning to improve, actually. In terms of those bodies that don't necessarily have the range of skills available to them that local authorities do, that's, that's something that's still to be developed, how they will actually approach their asset transfer processes um, when they don't ne they're not necessarily in the position of assessing um, various aspects of it. Ms Patterson, please. Um, Community Learning and Development Managers Scotland, so the bulk of their membership is our local authority uh, employees. And the kind of conflict of interest that was, was mentioned there is, is something that historically for our, our capacity building workers, our community workers, has, has uh, potentially been an issue. But that probably has d declined over, over time. And certainly as a, an organisation, um, our role is to support community capacity building staff to uh, affirm that their role is very much supporting the community to take forward the actions and the and to progress issues that are theirs rather than that of the of the worker and to try and create that um, um, uh, uh, division or wall essentially between uh, the fact that they're a local authority employee but the the uh, will of the, the the wishes of the community group are, are, are going in, in a direction that affects other parts of the the local authority so certainly in the way that the professional practice has been developed it's it's, it's been along uh, those kind of lines and I think also in re response to your your question around uh, capacity building for this the, the our, our workforce would recognize that uh, we don't necessarily within ourselves have all the skills to 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 support uh, community groups to to uh, progress asset transfer requests and we would call in uh, and uh, arrange and facilitate support to those community groups by um, other local organizations like the the, the CVS or indeed Linda's um, organization came and spoke to our, our membership uh, so that we would be aware of the um, support and services that were available nationally to our local groups who wanted to go down the uh, route of, of asset transfer. Mr Glover, please. Um, if I just comment very briefly, <coughs> um, I agree with what's been said uh, by other panel members about conflict of interest. I think the reality is that local authority officials or other public body officials, if they are trying to support a community group, may find themselves in a conflict of interest situation with their particular role. And I think, that particularly, we're talking to, particularly in the context of asset transfer, there is going to, I think in almost every case, there's going to be a degree of negotiation. And you can't, actually, you can't really negotiate with yourself. The, if you're talking about negotiating in terms of a lease, you do actually need two informed parties having a dialogue about, about the terms of a lease. So I think, the, <coughs> I think there is a need for support services for communities out, out with the, the, public, the public sector landowners themselves. And as has been said, I mean, the, the service which Linda and her colleagues supply within the limited remit, the service I supply, I think is one which is needed and will need to be developed as the... Once the bill is passed and as, as, we, as we work towards commencement, I think we'll need to work, work up the third sector support services to make sure that we're ready to hit the ground running in relation to asset transfer and participation requests. Mr Parker, please. 
Um, I think I, only I'd say that, um, again, I think one of the things that always matters in, in any type of community empowerment, whether you're talking right across the board, right across all the provisions in, in this bill, um, it's always important to be clear about um, which agendas which parties have within that discussion. Um, every, all the cards have to be out on the table, otherwise it's not um, an empowering engagement uh, for either side. Um, I think others probably have more of an expertise to, to bring to this in terms of the asset transfer um, type parts of the bill. And I think it is, it's more of an issue um, with those kind of things because it's much more of a kind of a, a, a legalistic dialogue and an outcome and so on. Um, I think it's a little bit less of an issue with, with the participation request thing, where it's much more um, a, a kind of co-production. Co it's a getting alongside each other and, and taking those decisions together kind of process that I think we're, we're looking towards. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. I just wanted to take up a point with Mr Glover. You mentioned in your submission that the bill has nothing, that does nothing to introduce to promote the community use of privately owned land. Are you advocating it should be either purchased or leased? And what is your opinion on that? Could you... Yes, yeah, sorry. You, you, you said you, in your... The second in, part of the question, please. Yeah, you said as <coughs> nothing in the bill is introduced. Does anything to promote, meanwhile, community use of privately owned land? Are you advocating that we should either you should be allowed to purchase it or lease it? What is your? I didn't quite see what your point was there. Um, yes, where I I use the expression meanwhile use to um, to uh, in the context of temporary use. So what I'm the point I'm looking there is privately owned land, which is perhaps land banked for future housing, mm -hmm. but which is not being built on at the moment. And whilst the Whilst the, the bill extends the right to buy, if land is intended, intended for housing, then it's probably not going to be in the public interest for the, commu for the community to buy it. Um, and whilst the bill allows participation requests and asset transfer requests <coughs> to be made to devolve public sector authorities, there's, no there's nothing within the bill as it stands which increases the chance of a private sector landowner agreeing temporarily t to lease or to license land to a community. <clears throat> and my experience is that there is, although there are a few shiny examples of what I say good, good practice, my experience generally is there is a reluctance on the part of landowners to let communities use their land temporarily. And I think there are various reasons for that. I think there are issues in the planning system where landowners may be concerned that the, they will prejudice their, their long-term planning use for the land. Um, there, are, there are certainly valid concerns about whether a landowner will get their land back if you let a community group onto it. Will the, if you agree a lease for, say, three years, will the community group leave, leave voluntarily at the end of three years? And if not, as a landowner, what reputational damage will you suffer if you have to go through legal processes to, to regain possession? I think there are issues, <clears throat> there are issues in, in the law of leases, that the, um, the, 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 particularly in the processes for terminating leases, are, are really quite obscure, and that scares people off. And also I think there are issues of professional risk aversion in here, that land professionals, such as surveyors, and, and lawyers may well be saying to the employers, no, don't let the community onto your land because it will just cause you, cause you problems. Um, contamin contamination is, not, is another issue where people have concerns about where liabilities for remediation may lie. So I think there are a range of other things which could be done, not necessarily within this bill, but which could be done legislatively to try and promote more community use of pri privately owned land. I think a lot of that is with the, uh, with the scope of this bill. Yeah. So if you could try and restrict it to the bill, please, Cameron. Certainly. Um, there appeals to be no appeal mechanism. Are you in favour of an appeal mechanism if a request is denied? Um, if if you permit me, convener, to make a fairly technical answer to that, um, the I thought that I, I thought the bill was satisfactory because although there's no appeal provision on the face of the bill, uh, normal administrative law will still apply. So that if, um, because we're looking at discretionary decisions by councils here, if a council takes an irrational decision, that will be challengeable under the normal rules of administrative law, 
without the need for a special appeals process. And in, cons in considering this point at the stage of the last government consultation on the bill, I couldn't think of a way of improving on what the common law or already provides in terms of an appeal process. Could I briefly on the participation request process, but I suppose the question where I'm trying to come with for this is that how serious, for example, local government will take this and what kind of priority it would actually have. I suspect if you go into many communities right now and you talk about outcomes, even amongst many of the community groups, they won't be that averse up on what the, the, the outcomes are, if there are indeed any local outcomes. Um, and given local authorities are under immense pressure, their social work budgets are overspending, their education budgets are overspending, in Fife's case, they're projecting £70 million <laughs> of service cuts that they've got to make over the next week while. So CLD, for example, will be seen as perhaps one of the Cinderella services. Mm -hmm. Is there a need to actually go further in terms of this bill and the legislation that actually forces community planning partners to, to, to go further in terms of engaging with local communities, um, particularly around, around looking at local outcome plans? Mr Doherty, we'll start with you, please. Mr. The Chair, the, the element of collaboration across differing community planning partnerships, it, it differs across all of them in terms of the relationships either with NHS boards, uh, with other public bodies. Uh, from our interest, the sooner that you involve either an individual or a group in the process of planning, um, the better off it will become and the easier it is either to design services which meet their needs, not the needs of public sector, the third sector or the private sector, but your community's needs. And if you're designing that service around them, you're meeting their need. We see that as a good thing. It doesn't, it's not a conflict against either the... I'm not, I'm not disagreeing yeah. with you. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally committed to the principle of this. What I'm saying is, given, given the current financial climate, given the difficulties, um, I can understand why local authorities looking at scarce resources, and I'm asking, do we need to go further with this, and do we need to put more into the bill to actually force local authorities to properly engage around outcome plans, etc. It maybe goes back to the answer I gave earlier on about culture change. And if, un if there's an unwillingness to have a change in the culture of engagement with communities and individuals, I don't think no matter how you change legislation, you will not see an improvement. What you need is people to change, individuals either within organisations or in both, and also in community groups uh, and also in the third sector to be willingness to work together. And I don't think uh, in any shape or form, Chair, that any piece of legislation could force people to do that. I'd find it very difficult. I think um, legislation can't do it, do it all on its own, but it can um, help stimulate culture change and um, so it can play an important role. Um, I think um, on first principles um, that the that people the people who use public services are the greatest experts in those services. That applies um, whether public spending is increasing or decreasing, whether it's difficult decisions or whether it's um, happy decisions to be made. So that that principle always applies no matter what. I think in terms of what's in the bill, I think I'd be, be really interested in terms of what the Minister's response and how the Scottish Government might respond in terms of how they see that fitting in with, with everything. Um, I think how I see um, the participation request thing there is it's kind of a backstop. It's kind of when other things have been exhausted, um, communities can turn around and say, no, it's our right um, to be involved in these, these kind of decision-making make, things. But I think there are ways that this bill can be strengthened in terms of this to make sure that um, participation isn't just for Christmas or when it's requested kind of thing. I think it should be right or, right throughout the time. Um, and I think, um, again, it's uh, there isn't a silver bullet in terms of community empowerment, but I think the national um, community engagement standards are quite a, a shiny projectile in this regard. Um, so I think putting them onto a, a national standard, making sure that's something um, that whenever engagement is taking place, um, it's done well, it's done genuinely, um, which is the vast majority of cases, but making sure that's, that's always the case. Um, and I think one of those times that, that should apply is when um, community planning partnerships are, um, the bill requires them to draw up, um, it's not called a single outcome agreement anymore, it's called uh, out, um, 
a, a local outcomes improvement plan. Um, and so when they're drawing up a local outcomes improvement plan, I think one of the things that we need to see community planning partnerships doing much more in balance is um, at the moment their main purpose has been to do joint planning between different public services. And to be fair to them, that's kind of where they've been driven is to do that kind of thing. And that's a good purpose. It delivers better outcomes. But the other aspect involving communities in their local pub public services and how their local public services are planned, that's something that community planning partnerships have done less well, I think it's fair to say. Um, and I think, therefore, making sure that when they draw up that outcomes improvement plan, that is through a participative process um, with all the members of the community in that area. Um, I think that's really important and something that should be built into the bill. OK, Ms Patterson. Um, yes, I, I would agree that it is possible to, to go further in uh, uh, strengthening the, the bill and perhaps through um, regulation as well, so that the, the, the way that the bill is implemented is more in the spirit um, of uh, what, what's intended here. And the examples that have been given already, and the, and the one that I mentioned too, for example, in terms of participation, it's the process uh, as much as anything else. And there are limits to the extent to which you can legislate uh, for the process, but perhaps Perhaps you can regulate a, a bit more and say, well, the process will be like this. And as you mentioned yourself, terms like local outcome improvement, etc., are not ones that are necessarily trip off the tongue of our, our uh, community members. So I, I suppose it is about uh, making sure that the processes are, are clear enough and that, that jargon like that is translated to. What does this actually really mean for you? Why would you as a community want to get engaged with that? So I think that has to happen on a number of different levels, yes, in, in terms of perhaps making those concepts more explicit within the, the bill or the supporting regulation, but also in the expectation that support would be put in place uh, for uh, communities to, to, to access their, their rights, or even just about the processes being one that are inclusive and transparent and involve uh, communities from, from, the, from the very outset. Can I play the devil's advocate here? Because you talked about strengthening regulation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that many of us have faced, particularly those of us that have served in local authorities, is, uh, sorry, we can't do that because the regulations don't allow us to do so. So do you not think there should be a level of flexibility? Um, th that, that may be, be the case. I, I suppose I'm thinking um, my closest experience recently is with the CLD regulation, and it is quite explicit in um, asking and, and putting an onus on um, local authorities to, to uh, I, I identify needs within the community. It's quite explicit as to that, that the process uh, by which the three-year plan that we're obliged to, to uh, uh, put together is, is come about is quite explicit. In, in terms of um, what that three-year plan should contain. So uh, I, I think as an organisation, we see the, the, the benefits of that in, in enabling us to, to uh, uh, do what we do as Community Learning and Development Managers Scotland, and, and hopefully the, that, that would be possible to have those benefits without the constraints and flexibility that you, that you mentioned. Mr Glover. Um, my, my slight concern with Mr Rowley's suggestion would be that if one requires uh, public authorities to be more proactive, one could end up with a situation where the public authorities is imposing its will on the community rather than the community deciding what it wants to do. So my, my preference would be, rather than strengthening the bill in this area, my preference would be to treat this as an implementation issue where uh, it would be one of making sure the mechanisms are, are in place for share, sharing good practice so that successful community engagement in, in one part of the country can be shared, shared across the whole country. OK, Ms Gillespie, please. Um, uh, yes, I, mean, I'm, I obviously um, I'm, I'm here from an asset transfer point of view, but obviously work within the Development Trust Association Scotland, whom the bulk of the members deliver services within, the, 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 within their communities. And... and our view would be very much with John that it would actually be within the guidance rather than the legislation that you would encourage a kind of wider communication and consultation. Okay. Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you. Um, good morning, panel. Um, do you have any views on the, on the assumption that requests will actually be accepted unless there are any reasonable grounds for refusal? Let's start with Ms Gillespie, please. I think that's most welcome. And it... it it puts 
a, a, a very positive spin on the bill. So I would I think that will make it considerably easier for communities to move forward with asset acquisition. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Please. Uh, I agree. Yes, I think it's, it's quite a, a brave, innovative bit of drafting to express the bill that way. But I think it's the right way to do it. Ms. Patterson. Yes, I think in terms of both the participation requests and the asset transfer requests, that that's that's helpful. Mr. Parker. In terms of participation requests, it's positive, but I think it doesn't negate the need for some sort of appeal process. Um, and secondly, the other thing I'd say about the decision process, that, that section um, talks about the, the basis on which the decision has to be made. Um, and one of the things I think is missing from that is any um, aspect of um, uh, social, social inequality and poverty. Uh, and Mr. Doherty. Mm -hmm. I agree with what the, the rest of the panel said here, and I agree specifically with Robin in terms of an appeal process. I don't think any community group would either have the ability, in terms of a, a new one that's starting up with limited resources, to challenge any community body, uh, any uh, public body in the courts if they had to. I, I think it's quite unreasonable for very small volunteering involving world organisations who will be leading on this uh, to challenge any public body in the courts. So an appeals process would be most welcome. Yeah. Mr. McMillan. Section uh, 19, uh, subsection 5 of the bill um, talks about um, obviously that any reasonable grounds for refusing it, also, unless there are any reasonable grounds for refusing it. What, uh, what do you, or what would you suggest would be an unreasonable ground? Um, I think that's a very difficult question for mm -hmm. uh, panellists, uh, Mr. McMillan. Mm -hmm. Does Stop anybody want to have a, a stab at that? Cause, uh, I, I, uh, no, I wouldn't be keen myself, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Mr Glover? Um, I think you know, a plainly unreasonable ground would be where uh, a member of the public body wished, wished to use the asset for their, for their own benefit. Anybody else want to have a go? Ms Patterson. Yeah, in, in terms of the participation requests, the, the, um, it, the, within the bill there's a, a, a clause uh, about the uh, participation uh, theoretically lasting about two years and that, that uh, um, I, I, I thought, you know, there can't be another participation request on the, on the same subject. And... Uh, one of the things that concerns us is the, the, the fact that community engagement and community empowerment is an ongoing process. It, it tends not to you know, start and, and, and end. And if indeed the, the area in which that engagement or empowerment had been requested was still an ongoing issue, it doesn't seem uh, un, unreasonable. I'm just in answer to your question, it doesn't actually seem unreasonable for a community group to say, well, actually, that thing that we were involved in last year it still seems to be an issue we would like to continue uh, uh, to be in, involved and I, I think that I can see why that might be there I know it's there in the asset transfer um, element of the bill because there might be vexatious I think to quote uh, in the, from the from the um, memorandum requests for for asset transfer but I think in the, the case of, of community uh, engagement and empowerment and uh, we'd like to think that outcomes could be transformed and that we could achieve he health and well-being etc in a, a short time period but that tends not to be the case so I, I think that that is something that could be unreasonable to to either end the participation um, uh, prematurely or indeed if there was a, a, a reason to continue to engage that that would be with, withheld. Okay, John Wilson please. Thank you Convener. Good morning panel and let's start with the first question and the first question is really to Ms Gillespie and hopefully it's open to the rest of the panel to answer this. Ms Gillespie you gave some examples, you gave two local authority examples in one of your answers in terms of good, what you consider to be good practice. Could you give or hint at some of the areas where there's less than good practice currently in existence in terms of community engagement? Ms Gillespie? Um, I, I, I think um, we're, we're seeing a much more nuanced approach from smaller local authorities that are, have, have smaller communities, more clearly defined communities. Um, so the East Ayrshire example talked about that kind of very nuanced approach about this is a bit sustainable asset transfer where you're you're talking about a larger local authority or a met and a metropolitan area then the ability to define communities um that these particular local authorities can find it quite difficult to articulate what what community 
how they would define their communities and how they would transfer those assets. There's a thing, there is also an element about the value of assets, which when you come into cities makes it more challenging for local authorities. So I would say certainly the more metropolitan local authorities um, are, are taking a more cautious approach to the development of their strategies. Okay. Does anybody else want to come in on that? Mr Parker, please. Um, so these are, these are generalisations rather than specific examples. Um, but I think one thing that came up a bit in discussion with the last panel that, that, that you had um, was about the point in which the process, the engagement takes place. I think it's really important it happens at the start of the process. Um, otherwise, you kind of uh, community can get left with a, um, you know, there's there's two schools that we can shut. We think we should shut this one. What do you think? That's that's not really a genuine engagement. It, if you if you start at the beginning of the process and you work through this is a difficult decision that, that we have to make. How can we best make this together? That's a much more positive engagement. Um, and one of the reasons why I think um, you know if the, the start of the whole process, uh, as it were, is going to be um, the outcomes plan for the for the community planning partnerships. So that's where you have to have a really participative process uh, for folk to get involved in. Um, I think second, um, often you, um, groups can be described as hard to reach, um, and a term we much prefer as, as Bernardo's is to talk about groups who are easy to, to easy to ignore. Um, and I think building into this um, ways that uh, public bodies can be made to think about who the, who those group, groups are and be made to um, take make particular efforts to involve those groups uh, is particularly important. Um, and then lastly, chipping in a, a bit on the previous point, um, the kind of what is a community kind of thing is actually, you know, we're, we're talking about community engagement in terms of this bill, but what is a community isn't something that's really come into it. Um, and I think often we can make um, easy thinking that it's the whole of the local authority area or something like that is a coherent community <laughs> where clearly it isn't. Um, and often I think, you know, we're, we're an organisation that works a lot with families. Um, and so families often, um, a sense of a community is something much more the size of a, a school catchment area, something like that. Um, you've also got communities of interest that we, we, are, we talked about before. Often that's a really strong sense of community for a lot of people. Um, and so I think um, something that isn't in the bill, um, but something that should be reflected in this whole process is thinking about much smaller scale things. Um, one of the things that the Public Bodies Joint Working Act did was made um, organisations think both about across the whole local authority planning area, but also much smaller community levels. Um, and that should be something that happens. It's something that happens in some community planning partnerships. In one of the responses, Mr Glover made reference to the public interest test. Uh, and this is quite important in terms of applications by communities in terms of asset transfers. Who does the panel think should apply the public interest test? And again, an example I'll give you is where, and Mr Glover made reference to land that's set aside or land banked by either a developer, housing developer, or in some cases a large retail supermarket. Uh, who should make the final or the final arbiter in relation to whether or not it would be in the public interest to transfer an asset to a community or uh, retain the right of the a housing developer or another entity to actually keep the land banked? Uh, uh, again, I'm going to stop you there because that's, that's out with the scope of the bill and it is uh, land owned by private authorities and we are dealing um, with the community empowerment bill. Um, but you could answer the question, forget the, the uh, land banking okay. by private developers can, aspect. Can, can I re re turn that around, convener, then? Can I, in terms of land owned by local authorities, where local authorities have identified it would possibly be better used for housing, private housing development. Who do you think should be the, be the arbiter in those decisions in terms of the public interest? You turned out that around well. Ms Gillespie. <laughs> the elected members. The, the decision should be with the elected members with the local authority. Um, I agree with Linda on that. Um, one area here which um, with, hopefully remains within scope is I think the, it's worth considering this question in the context of what are sometimes called arm's length companies or what the, the, what the bill calls public, public companies, which are companies which are wholly owned by a public authority. 
Um, and I've been speaking uh, with one of my stakeholders about a specific site in Edinburgh, which is in that situation. And that has led us to the view that the bill is perhaps wrong in the, treat in the treatment of these publicly owned companies. In the, as the bill stands at the moment, the Part 3 and Part 5 would only apply to such a company if it's, if it's been specified in the statutory instrument. And our consideration at that point has led us to the view it should be the other way around, that the, the default position should be that the Parts 3 and 5 apply to, pub, to public companies unless they have been accepted by a statutory instrument, because it's not possible for communities to necessarily identify all the right company, companies, whereas it, it is possible for those companies to put their hands up and explain why it is that they should not be subject to the provisions of, of the bill. Ms. Patterson. The role of our organisation created to support community bodies to seek whatever recourse or challenge that they had available to them, so we wouldn't comment on that. Thank you. Mr. Parker. I don't think I have a view in terms of Part yeah. 4 and 5. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Doherty, do you have a view? Briefly, Chair, if the, the process had been designed with the assistance of the local community, I would agree uh, with Linda that the fundamental decision lies with the elected members of the local authority. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your evidence uh, today, folks. Uh, uh, it's been extremely useful indeed. Uh, I suspend now for a change of witnesses. And you've got time if you need.
Okay, thank you. Um, we now move on to our final panel. Uh, it says for this morning, but it's now this afternoon. Um, and uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dowie Morgan, who's the chair of Old Aberdeen Community Council, Ryan Curry, uh, project manager of Real Time Music, Teresa Aitken, Glen Boyg Neighbourhood House, Alice Bovo, St Mary Centre Dundee, and Yvonne Tosh of Douglas Community Open Spaces Group Dundee. Uh, welcome to you all. I understand that some of you have already said to the clerks that uh, there was a, a, a lot of gobbledygook earlier on, which I have a big bugbear about. Um, I agree with you. And if we actually move into that sphere, uh, then feel free to, to try and intervene and slap our fingers uh, for it. Um, would any of you like to make any opening statements at all? Uh, if we start with Dowie Morgan, please. First of all, uh, Fader not chair the web admin and newsletter and general letter writer of the uh, Old Aberdeen Community Council. <laughs> but um, we, we do applaud the Scottish Government's wish to encourage the subsidiarity and local decision-making. But while the proposed bill could potentially open up new avenues for community involvement, there's a real fear at community council level that this might simply get used and abused by local authorities to offer, offload their costly facilities and services to an unpaid and largely unwilling community group on the basis of take it over or we're just going to close it. With particular reference to the participation opportunity, will a local authority or development body really be prepared to take into consideration the basically parochial opinions and desires of a local community? The record so far is pretty abysmal. Ms. Aitken, you indicated. I'd just like to say that I'm really disappointed that there's no representative from North Lanarkshire here today, uh, because this is a really important time for us in North Lanarkshire when we're just about to develop uh, the community asset transfer policy, and I think it would have been really important for someone to be here to represent us. Uh, thank you for that. That has gone on the record, and we will write to North Lanarkshire uh, about the situation today. Anybody else want to, to contribute at this time? Okay. Ms. Bovo. Introduction. Um, I'm actually here today as an organisation which has already worked as a community to have a community facility built in an area where the council were refusing to build one. So I'm talking about basically the tried and tested community engagement that we had to go through for, for this to take place and also other community engagement for other services in the area. Thank you, and that, that's very much appreciated, because some of us have had the opportunity uh, to hear more about that when we visited Dundee previously, but anything you wish to add, uh, we'd be certainly grateful for. Um, if I could maybe um, start off uh, round about um, existing uh, uh, powers, uh, do you think that uh, uh, currently um, uh, public bodies uh, adhere to, to what they should be doing at this moment without the um, Community Empowerment Bill uh, being in place. And Mr Morgan, if I can maybe turn to you first, because you previously wrote to the committee about issues that, that you felt were not being addressed properly yeah. by the local authority in this case. I think they adhere to the, the rules of what they have to do, and that's, that's it. They will not go a, a step further than that. On planning applications, they will send out the, the weekly form because that is what legislation has said that they shall do. No more will they do. We have to do all the running. Ms Aitken, do you have a, a view on that? Uh, I think they do just what, what, what they have to do. There's no consistency. And I totally agree that we have to do all the running. Uh, you know, you can meet with officers and there could be deadlines for information to come back and the community's got to do the running. The deadlines are, are, aren't met. You know, there's no consistency or accountability. From the community, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Curry. Yeah, I have very limited experience in that area, but I would say, echo the, 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 my colleagues here, that it's just as much to get by and also, I would, I would say that I don't, it doesn't always seem to be joined up to anything greater. It's very much uh, by a piecemeal basis. OK. Ms Tosh? Well, we're different in Dundee because the councillor, we're actually quite lucky. We do get a lot of help. We, do, we have to fight sometimes to get it, to get the right person to help with. But in the long run, we usually do get help. 
quite easily and the dues sustain. So that's a big help. Uh, and Ms Bovo? Yeah, I feel the communities wish the local bodies should be led by communities. If communities are inundated with lots and lots of information that they haven't actually asked for or training they haven't actually required, you could be drowning them in it and that way you lose your volunteers. You want to keep volunteers, you want to treat them as very responsible people who can make decisions and not bombard them with education from those bodies. Information, yes, that would be great having more information. But as, as my colleague said, in Dundee, we're quite lucky. We can access people um, through communities officers who will help us with every individual aspect of what we're trying to do. Mr. Hosey said earlier, and obviously some of us, uh, when we were in Dundee, have heard about s certain things that go on there. And uh, one of the things that was, me was mentioned is that um, forum that meets every three months, I think it is, uh, where it seems to be pretty community driven, um, which obviously leads to the exporting of good ideas and, and probably creates a camaraderie so that you can get what you want for your communities. Do you think that that works well? And do you think that that would work well in other parts of the country? I think it could work well in parts of the country, but the community have got to, to do some work themselves on this and make their voices heard. They can't just go along to a committee like this and not speak up for themselves. They've got to speak up for themselves, say what they require, if it be something to do with the environment, tackle that with the person who's there. If it's something to do with education, with social work, with NHS, you know, tackle that with the people who are sitting around that table. Also, take a note of the person's name so that out with those three monthly meetings, you, know, you can contact them and say, but you said at that meeting that you would do this for us, so we're keeping you to that. So I think that is a good way of contacting people. I think you talked about the names before, so that accountability, mm -hmm. uh, accountability continues. Yeah. 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 Ms Tosh, do you...? Yes, I totally agree with that, because uh, on the LC Local pan Partnership, uh, if we have a problem in our community, we go to the committee and we'll speak to the people directly that are in post on those different departments. And then, as Alice says, we'll get a note of their names and then we get back to them. And if they don't get back to us in a reasonable time, then we go forward and say to them, you were meant to come back to us, why haven't you? And if there's a good enough reason, then that's fair. But if they've just forgot, then we'll phone them again. <laughs> and we'll <But>, keep going. <laughs> good. Um, Mr Curry, do you have a, a view on that? Because obviously it seems that Dundee has, has got it slightly different from, from other areas. What, what specifically? Uh, in terms of bringing communities uh, uh, together uh, and, and then having that level of accountability that's been talked about. If you feel that you can't answer the question, then... I think my experience was that um, one of the terms I read in one of the previous uh, meeting papers was sharp elbow syndrome. <laughs> and I think that really struck home with me in my experience that I think over, uh, over time, it's usually the sort of same faces who would, who would be involved in those processes. Um, that would be my experience. I think the other point I would make is that to a certain extent, maybe in some cases, the the, the wrong thing is being incentivised in terms of, like, an example, again, just my own opinion, community learning and development partnership meetings. I think the, the, the incentive was to just have the meeting and not actually be accountable for results of uh, action set in those meetings. So you could tend to find organisations are asked to go along to certain meetings just for the sake of it. And the difference that you have there is, if you work for a public yeah. sector body, nobody's thinking how much that costs. If you work in the voluntary sector or, or other areas, everybody here can tell you how much that costs and how much it impacts on the organisation to be going along to these, these, uh, these meetings. Ms Aitken? 
I think Dundee's got a, a great uh, thing going there, by the way. When I was listening, I thought that was really good. The forums are a good idea. I think uh, what we find is there are too many layers. People don't know what layers they've got to go through to get to the partnership, basically. You know, th there's different layers that you have to go through. And there are community groups out there that maybe haven't got the knowledge and understanding to take them up to the level and to find the person that they actually have to speak to. Uh, I think, you know, because we, we've been about for a long time, we would probably use our elected members eventually. You know, if, if we don't get the cly, people don't come back to us. We, we would keep going back to them again. And if, if we didn't get that accountability, we would then use the elected members. But community groups that haven't been out there for a long time don't know what the platforms are and what stages they've got to go through. And I think that has to be made clearer, you know, if, uh, at a community level, basically. Thank you. Mr Morrigan, please. I think I, I disagree with Ms Aiken's terms, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Mark MacDonald, please. Thank you, Commissioner. I spoke earlier to both the panels about um, the ability of some communities to, to essentially uh, work out what, who they need to speak to and also having the ability to um, go through, for example, grant applications and things like that and other communities who maybe need a bit of support to do that. What, what are your experiences around... Um, the, the need for support to, to get maybe grant applications or to go through transfer of assets uh, and, and where did you look to for that support and was it uh, readily available from public bodies? Ms Bovo, having gone through some of the, the process of establishing something new, do you want to go first? Well, first and foremost, uh, if we're talking just about the grant funding, first and foremost we thought we would try the lottery. The need for a community facility in St Mary's was identified through community plans. And before that, they had been offered flats and houses. It wasn't sufficient for an area as big as St Mary's. Um, we, as I say, went to the lottery board, but it, it was because we were getting help from the council, it was too close to them. And eventually we got actually to the judging table and we were expecting a yes after that. And we got a, a phone call back saying, we've refused the application. We actually invited them up to Dundee and said, why did you refuse the application? And we got a lot of gobbledygook, as uh, Yvonne says. And, but we pulled them up on it and said, it's all right, we're going to build the centre anyway. Whether we get funding from you, we'll look elsewhere. And we did. We got European funding, regeneration funding. And I think that's the funding part of it. I think from the very start, you've got to get volunteers on board. You've got to speak to the local community. You've got to speak to the young, right up to the old, and ask what they would see this, the shape this community facility would be in before you can apply for funding. Because you don't know what size they would want, what's affordable, you know, the things they would like, the hours they would like to open. And so get your community on board immediately on something they want to get their teeth into. Keep the, the momentum going with your community. Don't just sit back and expect the community to ride along with you. Because my knowledge of communities is, whether they're poor communities or not, they're very interested in things that are going on in their area. And they're very community-based people. And so, yeah. OK, I, I, I wonder, in terms of the funding aspect, did you get a lot of help from the local authority in terms of trying to access that European funding yes, in particular? Because that's not particularly easy. No, we, we did. That was, that was done, actually, in conjunction with the lottery funding. The lottery funding, um, a, a lot of that funding was to be to employ admin workers and advisors. In, when we didn't get that, obviously, now it's community-run, led by communities, worked on by communities, and opened by communities. Basically, we do everything there, cleaning the lot. Um, but that was mainly the lottery funding, some part of building. So we'd actually worked in tandem with European funding at that time. Uh, we were also fortunate, I think it could be, or it could be one of the only people, uh, places in, Dun in Scotland, we've got the Territorial Army on board as well. So they have given us a donation of money and they have the whole top section of the community facility, which is theirs. Uh, we can gain access to it, but we don't because that's their personal property unless there's a problem with any, any power strikes or anything like that going on. Um, so it was a loss at the time, 
uh, Dundee City Council were very supportive. <clears throat> and I, I, I'll always remember, and I'll quote it, a certain person in the council, the very first meeting I went into with her said to me, I don't agree with the community centre, and I don't want any more community centres in Dundee to manage, but I'll support you, and I'll give you all the help you need to get it. So we did have the support right from day one with them. So I can't complain about the support we've had from Dundee City Council. Thank you. Does anybody else want to pick up on Mr Macdonald's question? Yes. Uh, we're, oh, Yvonne, sorry. Yvonne first, please. Well, I, we're the opposite to Alice. Alice has already went through all the process. We are on the very beginnings. So funding has been quite hard for us because we keep... Uh, getting told that we fit the criteria and then when we put it in it's too official it's words and then it came back and then we wrote it in our language and it came back because we don't fit the criteria <laughs> what's that about that doesn't make sense <coughs> but no funding is quite hard but as soon as you get charitable status then it's a, they say it's meant to be easier, but no, I think it's still a fight to get funding. Do you, do you think the bill itself may help get you the help that's required to get through the, the bureaucracy of, oh, that's too official or, you know, that's uh, not enough? I mean, because we do have workers from the council that do help us with funding and they're brilliant. I mean, we just... We just keep getting all these funding applications, fill them out and send them back and keep sending no. Okay. But uh, that's only that's one of the grumbles. But apart from the funding, as Alice said, about um, getting the community on board, if you don't have the support of the community, you'll never get it moving. Okay, thank you. Uh, Teresa, please. I'll speak about the support. First, we've been involved in trying to... Uh, gain a community asset uh, for over seven years now and it started off with the being asked by the local council to take over the local community centre which we were quite keen to do we'd based in a small building which is two old police cottages with no space basically it's just the cottages and we were quite happy to do that we went get a feasibility study looked at it went back to the council and discovered that we didn't have it there wasn't enough parking space so it was blown out of the water so we then identified a piece of land in, in our area that we could take over went to the lottery and got substantial funding from the lottery to carry out site investigations carried out site investigations to find that we needed a quarter million pound worth of remediation on the site before we could build on it uh, we've went from fitting the criteria for the vacant and derelict, derelict land fund to not fitting the criteria to the council having spent their money for this year but we'll put you forward for next year when the next year comes they've already spent their money basically uh, and also the the cost of the land was prohibitive and we had to reduce the size of the the scale of the building uh, that, that we were building so we had to go back to the council and say well we, we need the whole scale to get the car park in, basically, and they decided they would lease us a part and sell us a part, which the big lottery eh, wouldn't have been interested in. Uh, so we've been, we've been having this fight for years, and we've found that you know, we're up against officers, and when we take it up to the top of the council, we get sent back down to the same officer again. So we, we just felt as if we were, were up against a, a brick wall, and the elected members couldn't seem to get through either. And I'll be there a second, because do you think participation requests and the community themselves being able to ask the reasoning why and influencing the decisions about, for example, the derelict land fund mm -hmm. would be helpful in that regard. Yeah, I do. I think the participation uh, is going to give us a stronger voice and it's going to enable us to ask questions that we can't ask just now. I think it's going to make a uh, make people accountable. Basically. Instead of getting put for pillar to post and yeah. then back to the original yeah. person. I, th I think it will. Thank and that's you. only part of my story. I'll let somebody else speak. <laughs> <laughs> Dowie, please. Yes, and we haven't got uh, much uh, experience of, of uh, seeking grants, but the, we created a Friends of Seaton Park recently as the park was falling into, into heavy disrepair. And there, there seems to be no drive at all to help us with grants. Um, Partly, probably the, the, the group itself is, has not got the, the skills to sort of go back banging on doors 
to either to the ground company itself or even to the Aberdeen Council. Um, things may change a little bit as there's been an hour change in the management group. But it just seemed like that they, were, they were happy to have the group because it looked good for the Britain in Bloom competition and it had a little rubber stamp on. But there was no, great, you've started, now here's all the tools you can have. There was no outward sort of giving, really. It was a pat on the head and off you go. Not and that. in terms of that kind of situation, um, and again, I, I'm going to have to be a little bit parochial, and, and I'm sorry for, for this. Um, you know, in the past, there have been groups formed round about um, a, a park at Sunnybank, for example, where there seemed to be um, much more help given to, to the local group. Do you think participation requests would be helpful um, f from that perspective for you if you were able to find out what they got, um, why you haven't got that, and the reasoning behind why you haven't had the same level of service, if you like? Well, the Sunnybank uh, Park uh, group was was led by a council officer, which meant that he had the inside track, of course. He knew the systems, he knew the people to talk to, and he knew how to do it. Um, the friend... We should say that a council officer not acting as a council officer, but in his spare time. Yes, uh, yeah. certainly, sorry, yes. Um, the Seaton Park group is, has no council officers on it, and although I was instrument in, in getting the group started it was really for, as a as a member of the community council and I, it was important to me that i didn't run the the, the 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 friends because it would become almost like a, a one-man band i thought it was important that if, if the if the group of friends who said they wanted us to save the park weren't prepared to stand up and run it then so be it so it's been it's, it's really what people are available to, to run and, and what their skills are and it, it's, it can be limited Mark, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and that, I guess, builds into the, the point I made earlier around who, who are the best people to give that support and, mm. and are there occasions where you have found um, that perhaps there's been a, not necessarily a lack of willingness <laughs> from, from local authority, but a view from the local authority that they, they can't be seen to be supporting a group while at the same time being on the other side of the equation, uh, perhaps negotiating with a group. Uh, has that come up at any point, or, or do you see that being a potential um, pitfall if there isn't maybe the support available? Who wants to have a crack at that first? Mr Morgan. And to control the group, you know, we want you to do this amount and, and that's it. Go and paint this, go and weed this, um, we'll put your name on this. So it's, it's the opposite to providing the support, really. Anybody else want to come in on that one? I think uh, sometimes what we felt is, you know, if you're after a piece of land or an assay and, and you're not managing to take it forward, you know, is it going to be used for something else? Have the, have the council got other ideas for this? And if they have, would they please tell us so that we're not wasting our time? Uh, you know, so I, I, that's what we've kind of come <coughs> up against. OK. In the city wide in Dundee, because <clears throat> we have community officers working all the, the regeneration areas who um, basically work for that area, my area, Strathmartin. So they designated for that area, but then they meet with the rest of those officers on, I think it's a monthly basis, but they meet regularly with the chief executive. So they're carrying forward the needs and wishes of the area. They're speaking to the, the volunteers in that area they're speaking to. So I think we're evenly divided in Dundee with the support we get for each area. I don't think it's one area preferred to another. So in, in terms of the Dundee aspect, you've got all of these fora, you've got your own community officers, mm -hmm. and the community officers themselves are feeding up to the yeah, very top, feeding right up to the, top, to yeah. the chief executive, who mm -hmm. obviously has a major role to play in the community planning yeah. uh, organisation in Dundee. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I think it would be very interesting uh, for the committee to write to the other community planning partnerships to find out if, if they are at that level and get that response. Um, of honour, Ryan, do you want to add anything to, to well, Mark's question? The only thing that I could say is uh, sort of about the land. Uh, the land that we've, we're <coughs> su hopefully successfully getting uh, was an old school that got knocked down. And it was only through the community that wanted it for a community thing because the council wanted it for housing. 
mm -hmm. and they were very adamant at the beginning they wanted it for housing and that's how we got it because we stuck up okay okay ryan do you want to to come in here um we're at quite an interesting stage because we're at the very very early stages of of asset transfer so the 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 key thing I would say there is that for maybe a period of about seven or eight years, we knew as an organisation, as a small charity, that we had outgrown the physical resources we were in. And any time we made an inquiry about possible uh, consultation with North Lancashire Council about any asset transfer, the the result was a dead end meeting with someone in property who said, "No, you're not getting that because that caught, we we would make too much money from selling that." Um, so, I would say there's a crossed purpose there, just in terms of speak. If, if you're speaking to those particular individuals, the purpose in that department is completely different from what we were looking for, uh. and that's a fundamental point. I would say um, the fact that there's no directly responsible individual related to community asset transfer in the past was a problem because again how do you access an entire authority at what level do you go in and who what phone number do you call on your phone um, and also i kind of feel as if in the past um you were almost um disrupting the activity of the local authority whereas this this new process is systematic and you would you'd be going through a process, so you're not a kind of peculiar case over here somewhere. Okay, that's very useful. Mark, do you want to come back? Okay, uh, Stuart, please. Thank you, convener. And good afternoon, uh, panel. Uh, just I'll pick up on that final point, uh, if I may. In the previous session, uh, we'd heard um, various we heard some evidence regarding uh, the issue of having a, a person who was allocated to deal with the asset transfer. Uh, and we had some uh, some conflicting evidence saying actually well there shouldn't really be uh, a, a single person but it should be something within the culture uh, of that organisation. Um, uh, certainly going forward and with also with the bill in mind, do you think it would be useful to uh, potentially even have that type of person in the short term or even medium term, maybe say for about five years or so and then uh, for that job to disappear as such? But, uh, but within that period of time, to actually uh, try to increase that culture uh, within uh, within local authorities, so more people actually are aware of the whole issue of asset transfer. Does anybody want to? I would say yes. Uh, Yvonne, you say yes. Mm -hmm. Teresa. I would say yes. It's vital. Uh, we need one person that we can go and speak to. You know, uh, as Ryan said, we're speaking to a whole authority. You don't know what person in the authority you're speaking to, and within the authority. And within the departments, they don't communicate with each other. So you, you, you have to communicate with all the different departments. I mean, we, we're just at the, the stage of a pilot of, of developing a community asset transfer. And we've just taken over an asset, basically. And we were supposed to take over it in December. We didn't take over it till March. We only get the first management fees in July after fighting for them. We haven't got a service level agreement, and we've still got a draft lease. And, you know, so... I think there really needs to be someone there uh, that can help through the process, and I think maybe probably the longer term. So all of that, does that affect the original business plan that you put forward, the fact that ah, these things have not fallen into place? Yeah, it affects everything that we're trying to do, basically, uh, because we, we're taking over a building and we required, one of the stipulations was we require the management fees to enable us firstly to, to run the building and to, to provide the services that were already being provided there, expand and, and build more services in. And if we hadn't, the management fees weren't in place, then we were going to fall down at the first hurdle. Ah, okay. You know, and that's where we feel that we are, that we keep getting knocked down at the first hurdle. Does anyone else want to, to answer Stuart's question? Just, just to agree that uh, in, a, in a business sense, an engineering sense, if there were two organisations working together on a project, you would always have an interface engineer. You need to know who to go to and somebody who can then disseminate those thoughts out to the other organisation. Stuart, do you want to come back? That's been very useful. Um, also, with the bill in mind, um, have each of your organisations actually had maybe an increase in interest of people actually wanting to volunteer and get involved 
Um, and if so, uh, have, are they bringing forward and uh, bringing with them uh, some additional skills that you maybe don't currently have that can actually help, certainly with the implementation of this, uh, when the bill goes through the parliamentary process? Or you can also be brutally honest and say uh, whether or not folk actually know about the bill at all. Um, although we've tried to disseminate, we, we know that there are always difficulties in that. So no. most folk don't know about the bill. Okay. So the simple answer to Stuart's question is that there's no been only additional volunteers because not many folk care about the bill. There's additional volunteers through word of mouth. I mean, people uh -huh. who have read the bill and who have sort of taken part in conferences like when you came to Dundee, um, they can impart that knowledge. We are managing now to um, encourage some young volunteers which is your future, really, to try and get them on board. OK, it's only for a couple of hours a week, but it's always the new volunteers coming on board. So when you talk to them and you ask an opinion of what they would like to see in there, um, it's good, and then you go on to explain to them. You don't just suddenly go into it with, this bill was published and this is what's happening, because young people don't want to be at school for all those years. They don't want all this thrown at them right away. They just want to come in do their bit for the community, know what's going on, and say what they want to do. And I think it's up to people like myself who will sit and read, um, can I dare say boring stuff? <laughs> I'll sit and read it and impart anything I've picked up from it that is um, in direct uh, benefit for the community. Okay, can I uh, make an appeal uh, and maybe a wee advert here in terms of uh, the boring stuff? It would be really good if you went back to your communities and told folk about this bill and asked them if they have any views, you know, to, to write in and let us know because we are still um, uh, looking uh, for folks' views on this. So if you could do that, we'd be immensely grateful. Uh, Thank you. to Theresa Aitken. In your comments earlier, I just, um, you mentioned um, in terms of the frustrations that you've had, and then you said that uh, you go to, well, you use elected members eventually, and I thought that was actually very interesting. Can you explain why eventually? Why, why wouldn't you go to them uh, at a sooner uh, partner process? Well, I think there's processes you have to follow. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think jumping right to elected member. We're not popular anyway, basically, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I've, I've wrote down about all the co-production co and participation and empowerment, you know, and, and we are uh, empowered people in our communities, uh, and co-production is something that we've been doing for, for lots of years and, and all the years that we've been in our communities. Is that a word that you would use when you're yapping to folk in your community about what you're doing? Certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, that, that you've got to give the opportunity to the person that's in post, basically, you know, the, the person that should be carrying out the job, the person that should be providing the information to you before you take it to the elected members. Because using, we, we do use the elected members a lot because we've come up against a lot of barriers over the years uh, to try and take on land and assets. And the only way that, that, we, that we manage to get through the brick wall is eventually with the elected members. But the reason we don't use them immediately is we, we like to follow the processes. And if, if nothing comes from that, then we certainly would go to elected member. OK, thank you very much. OK, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, panel. And this elected member is the chair of Glenboig Neighbourhood House and has been for a couple of years. So I'm not included in the elected members that Theresa Aitken refers to. She's actually referring to our local councillors that we uh, tend to involve if we're having particular problems. Having said that, made that declaration, Convener, I'd like to ask the panel, the one, if you've read the bill, in which clearly you have read the bill, I... Uh, what would you either add to the bill or what would you like to see strengthened within the proposed bill to make it easier for communities uh, taking forward the community empowerment legislation? Who wants to have a crack at that first? Alice, on you oh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think maybe the only thing I would um, encourage is communities having a stronger voice communities being included in other committees. <clears throat> I'm fortunate that I sort of, I'm on Dundee Partnership Management Group, so I can sort of go up to the top. And I'm also on other regeneration committees, but um, also worked in tenants' movements and children's panel. So it's all gaining knowledge, but you really need an encouragement and, if necessary, public speaking 
teaching some of the community members public speaking, so that it's not always left to two or three people who will go and give evidence like today. Um, apart from that, I think we get all the support we need. We've got contact with the right people. Um, and if we have a problem, we're not short in, in going to them and saying, you know, this is breaking down. I mean, if something's not been done after it's gone to the LCPP meetings, then you can follow it through and say, this has not been done. Your LCPP meetings are not working. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to have to do something. We're going to have to either get that person to go back to his seniors or her seniors and say, can I make a decision at that level? Because sometimes their hands are tied as well to make a decision on something important you're asking them to do. Um, so, so you're in a situation, even without the bill, where mm -hmm. things seem to be working pretty well? Without the bill, yeah, it, they are working pretty well. But um, unfortunately, it doesn't have to be done. It's not legislative. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be done. This legislation would um, make councils know that they have got to do this. Um, in Dundee, as I say, we're fortunate they do it, but they don't have to. So, yeah. I mean, it could be a whole new council comes in and decide, we don't want to work with the communities as closely as we've done up to now. We don't want to give them this voice that we've got just now. So, yeah, you've got to watch your back and you've got to look to the future. Thank you very much for that. Teresa, do you want to, to comment on that? Because obviously Dundee's working without the bill. Do you think it will help, help I, you? I think the bill will help. Uh, I mean, we don't have a community asset transfer policy. You know, we need the community asset transfer policies. I think the participation, having a voice, I, I think is, is going to make communities stronger. Uh, no, I, I think it definitely, it definitely will help uh, communities go forward. Does anybody else want to have a crack at John's question? I would say, yes. I would say yes, because the same as Alice, I mean, I've got lots of hats as well. Uh, but somebody that doesn't have so many contacts can actually help their community with this bill. I mean, it's good that I've got contacts, but somebody that doesn't, then this helps them so to can, get forward. Come back to John's question. Is there anything else you would add to the bill? Make it shorter. <laughs> Less gobbledygook, eh? I was going to say that. Less gobbledygook. Make it in plain English. Okay, Doc. Anyone else want to come in, Mr Morgan? Yes. I think that there is a problem that the bill is such a portmanteau bill. It, it covers so many issues. It makes it very difficult for anybody to work out what's going on there. And it took me several goes to realise what was there. And, you know, once you look at the document and the supporting ones, there's about 300 sides of A4 to read through and try and work out what it all means and which bits are relevant to your, your sort of uh, community, whatever it is. It's not easy. And th then, obviously, for that reason, there is a, the Idiot's Guide one, which is a bit embarrassing, really. Uh, I think we need something a bit between the Idiot's Guide and the, and the rest of it, because... People have, it's not just that you can't understand it. We've all read it. We've all understood what's in there. At, you know, after maybe two or three readings and maybe writing notes down. But we have the time. And again, every community person has to do this. If it's a planning application, you have to, you have to go and get the documents. You have to find out what it is. If it's a piece of law, you've got to find it. Then find out, well, is the community council actually part of this? Dig, dig, dig. Oh, yes, it goes in through this route. You don't make it easy for us to understand the stuff. Basically, okay. it, would it, could it help Aberdeen um, or our community council? I think I think it could. It depends how the local authority uses something like this. They could use it, as I say, as a tool to actually give us a harder, a harder, harder task. Okay, um, I understand that it's it's pretty tough going. That's why we've divided it up as well. I have to say, um, but you know, going back to your communities and talking about this, as uh, as I've been told to mention, it's the other advert. Have a look at a, a wee video that's been produced. We'll send it to you and pass it on to others. Unfortunately, folk will have to look at my face, but that's the unfortunate bit about it all. John, convener, in the earlier session we had evidence from Bernardo's and uh, other organisations, and in the written submissions, Bernardo's indicated that the community planning partnerships should set aside 1% of the overall community planning partnership budget for community engagement. Do you think there are enough resources there to allow communities to fully participate 
in the decision-making processes that you want to be engaged in? And are you, do you feel you have, with the exception of Alice and Yvonne, who seem to be quite clear and quite steadfast in terms of their engagement, but do the other panel members, maybe Yvonne and Alice, who'd want to comment as well, uh, do you think there are enough resources there to allow you to fully participate? I'm not just talking about participating on the edges. I'm talking about fully participate in the issues that you want to participate in in the decision-making structures that are out there making decisions. I think the resources are there. Um, not necessarily money resources, but assistance. I mean, we identify training that we need to take. Now, whether it be external training <laughs> or whether it be internal training. I mean, every year we have to go through disclosures, we've got to go through food and hygiene certificates, all the extra things we've got to do. There's also uh, policies that have to be kept up to date every year. So we have to go through training for that. Now, we couldn't do that just by ourselves. We need support from community officers to do all this. So we do get the support in kind, not in, in cash, because all our money is grant funded, all our income is grant funded. But in kind, yes, we do get lots of support from other people to basically bring our volunteers on to, and I know I'm saying they don't all read the bill, but they do get involved in the policies. They know what the policies should read for a management group uh, running a centre individually with, with a community-led body. Okay, does anybody else want to come in there? Theresa, please. I think through a uh, DTA a Scotland, we're members of DTA Scotland, I would say the resources in, in kind, you know, and the training that's available through them uh, has given us a great voice uh, to be able to uh, take part in the decision making. Uh, I think what we've learned uh, has been part of them over the years has, has really t been what's taken us forward. And obviously through like CL and D and different partners that there's, there's other training available. But to, to really take part in the decision making, you know, and, and have a voice in decision making, to free up your time, you would have to free up a, a lot more time. Basically, you're then talking about financial financial support, which I would say is not there. Basically, to free up time for, for people to go out. But as far as DTE Scotland is concerned, we've got a, a lot of their expert has been invaluable to us. Okay, thank you. Can we just for one final question? Yeah. If people haven't read the bill. We'll see that there's uh, issues about the definition of community organisation that local authorities and public bodies should engage with. Do you think there should be some tightening up of that community body aspect of it? Uh, because, as I said, they're, they're trying to get a definition of who should be able to participate and who should engage uh, in the decision-making policy structures of the council or community planning partnerships. Is, um the groups in the area I come from, we have one that deals with community safety, so that's the police you know you direct your questions to. We've got one that deals with um, the planning partnership, which is the, the management board in the centre. Um, we've got other ones that deal with churches, so we can get in touch with the local churches. Uh, we have one that deals with schools. So you, you do identify the different areas you're working with, and it's social behaviour. Um, if we're working on an issue in housing to do with antisocial behaviour, we know who to go to to bring them along. So I think it's identifying the right person for the right information and to come along to the right meeting. I mean, I wouldn't ask the police, well, I might ask the police to come along to an antisocial behaviour meeting, but not in maybe a housing improvement meeting. You're better saving their time, because they're strapped for time now, and inviting the right person in the initial stages and not wasting their time. Okay, does anybody else want to have a crack at John's question? Okay, Alec Riley, please. Could I ask the, I mean, Dundee has these local area plans, community plans, and how engaged are you in them? And could I ask the other, the other organisations, are you aware of the community planning partnership and is there local community plans and are you involved in them? Well, let's start with Dundee first. Alice, do you want to go first? In 2000, I mean, I, I'd lived in Ardor, which became a regeneration area. Um, so I moved up to St Mary's, and that was my first way, because I said I wasn't getting involved again in anything. So that was my first way of being involved, uh, going and getting 
tenants shoes and residents shoes on what they would like their aspirations for an area um, a wish list basically and if you and the community are wish list then say just you write down there what you would like put the post-it note up on the board and we will write this community plan so way way back in the early 2000s we had written this first community plan and this is where the idea for the community facility came out and lots of other things they wanted believe it or not the children want to tidy your gardens in the area. They don't like hanging about in an area that doesn't have tidy gardens and sufficient lighting. So they were coming away with simple things like that. So you've got to consult before you even think on a community plan. It's got to be a community plan led by the community. It can't be one that I represent the community and I go along and say, yeah, I think they need this and I think they need that. It's got to be everybody's views. I can't impart what I want onto them. So. Um, it was, as I say, way back in the early 2000s, before we had the LCPPs. I mean, the LCPPs are quite a new body. Regeneration forums came before the LCPPs, so they're quite a new body, the LCPPs, to this meeting. Um, I think every, I don't know how often it is, but we, we renew what's been done. We have a day that we renew, has this been done? Has this been carried out? Is this a still to do? or it hasn't been touched yet. And then we create another aspiration list, basically. OK. And in other areas, in terms of um, the community planning partnerships and below that, what are, what are you aware of and how are you involved? Well, Teresa? We, yeah, we are aware. I, I am aware of them anyway, you know, and I'm involved. You know, we can go to local area partnership meetings uh, once a month and uh, we can feed in. Uh, through CLND, we have a partnership through Community Learning Development, where a lot of organisations sit on that at a, a local level. We've also got a great network uh, in the Coat Ridge area, uh, where we have a steering group that uh, involves like NHS, the, the council, the, the, the police and everybody, and we work well at, at a local level, basically. Uh, and the Reshape and Care Agenda come up earlier, you know, and I thought that was... Uh, a great avenue for, for participation and North Lanarkshire is really taking that forward in a good way. And I think, you know, this bill kind of builds on that uh, for uh, reshaping care, shows what communities can do and how, how they can work and, and really build on structure and, and deliver and, and develop uh, really good projects within their area. Uh, I'm aware of the community improvement plan uh, and, and how it works as well uh, in the local area. Okay. Yvonne or Ryan or, or Dewey, do you want to add? Yes, I don't know of a community plan that's in operation in our area. There's, you know, we get involved in the formal ones, the local area plans and so on, and go through the, the formal process of putting comments into those sort of fairly tortuous documents. But uh, one, I've heard at the Community Council Forum that the central Aberdeen master plan consultation, here's a, a plan to sort of rejuvenate the whole centre, and there's no community council involvement. They managed to pull that together without any community council in it. OK, thank you. Ryan, do you want to...? Uh, I would say I'm aware of uh, CPP's outcome agreements and, and things like that in the North Lanarkshire area. I've seen all the diagrams and the fancy reports and, and things like that, but no, we're not involved. Um, and I was just thinking while the guys were talking there about why that, that is, and it's probably a, a blend of just fr from our own side, just as a small charity, very small, just the, the same as everyone else, just trying to keep your head above water with, with your own plans that you're, you're trying to get funding for and things like that. Um, but also, I would say it's quite... I, I can only speak for myself, but sometimes it's quite hard to see what, where you would fit in on these big co complex diagrams at what meeting should you go and what level should you be discussing things at. And So, um, so I think there's, there's something in that. Yvonne, do you want to add anything more for... Yes. Well, I would, well, me personally, it started off, I went for a nosy. That's what, it's, what it come down to. And, uh, and uh, it just grew. And now you do actually fit in and then you do put your point forward and say, right, this is what the community want, not what the council want. If the community wants something, you've got to fight for it like our green space, we've been fighting for a long time and we did do a lot of consultations with that and it did go to the LCP meeting and they said, yeah, it was a good idea. 
And when we did do the consultation, we got uh, little kids at five year old. One wee boy went, I know what I'd love. I said, what is it? He says, a swimming pool. <laughs> I said, I don't think we'll get a swimming pool in Douglas. He says, yes, but it's all right. When it's winter, it freezes. And we get to skating. <laughs> I went, right, okay, what do you say to that, to a six-year-old? That's somebody that's from the beginning. So if you empower them, then they'll go forward. Absolutely. I, I probably ended up here because I went for a nosy at once upon a time. Uh, <laughs> Cameron, please. These new powers will make a real difference to the communities, the powers that, from this bill. Who wants to, to go first? I've got to pick on somebody if somebody doesn't I'll volunteer. I'll go first. <laughs> Teresa, please. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> From my point of view, I think they will make a benefit to us because of the work we've been doing in North Lanarkshire over the, in, in Glenboyg over the last years. I mean, we need something that's going to make our council accountable, basically. you know. Uh, and I definitely think we need the bill. I, I, I think we need it for communities, make communities stronger, make not only councils, but all public bodies accountable. Uh, and I think it'll help, I think it'll help people that are setting up and help us to help them, basically. You know, if, the, if there's a proper document there, you know, it makes the council and NHS and any other body, makes them accountable. We can then go to other small groups that are setting up that are maybe, you know, you know it's, it's, a, it's a big thing setting up and taking on land or, or starting out projects and looking for funding. We've been there for a long time and we still find it quite scary eh, at times. I think this will help to get other communities up and empower other communities and enable them eh, to go forward. But before I bring others in, you said to begin with, I don't know, and then you were pretty positive about it. <laughs> well, I kind of um, thought and, about and, it. <laughs> and, 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 and sometimes, you know, the don't know factor. Um, do you think that we should revisit this again as a committee after the Act is in place to make sure it is working the way it should for communities? Oh, yes, because a lot of times, you know, bills and different things come in. Uh, they're supposed to be operational and they get put in the filing cabinet. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think you should revisit it. <clears throat> Grand. Thank you very much. Uh, Dowie, please. I think it will make a, a, a fantastic difference for one or two specific cases where, you know, we think of the, the, the Western Isles and there have been situations where people have been desperate to buy lands. I think it could make a difference for the smaller community organisations, but uh, I'll have to wait to see how it's actually... It's because it's in, it's in the council's remit or the local authority's remit as to whether they deliver or whether they go to the letter. If they go to the letter, not much will happen. What about in terms of participation requests, in terms of some of the difficulties that you have previously faced? Could it be the case that if participation requests are in place, you might not have to go through the rigmarole of actually going through a participation request because the council knows that they're there and you have that ability, do you think they might give you the answer sooner? There's, there's not necessarily need to be sort of... Uh, we don't want to be part, uh, participating in a sitting in committee meetings day after day. There's, there's always that desperate problem. Of, we don't want to get involved in that way. At the... The forum this week, there was a very, a very good description that we, we seem to be moving from a, a representative democracy to a participatory democracy. But we don't want to participate to the end of the earth. You know, we've, all, we've, only, we've got, you know, some of us have got day jobs and so on or, or, or domestic commitments. What we want is just the, the, the support we need. We don't have to sit on a committee the, well, unnecessarily. We were asked to sit on, uh, the, again, the Community Council Forum, to sit on the committee for two years to, uh -huh. to talk about the boundaries of the community councils. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Anybody else want to, to come in? I just think it's a very useful document to be able to, if you're asked advice from a group that's maybe just starting off, and I'm not talking about the local area now, but I'm still talking about Dundee, I often get asked to go and talk to a group who are maybe trying to set up a similar group that we have and it's handy to be able to take this document along and uh, refer to it in problems they're maybe having and it's down in writing and as you say it will become an act and it can be revisited if they're not managing to get the the access to officers that we get thank you and um i wonder if you oh, yeah, yeah brilliant yeah. just really to reiterate what you had mentioned earlier convener um 
known how large you are within your communities and how prominent you are and work hard in your communities. What plans had you put into place for to try and gain some or gather some information about the consultation itself? If any. Does anybody want to have a crack at that? Barely knew this was going on until the letter okay. came to uh, come and talk here. Really, that's it. And and then it's been a kind of doing a little bit, and then an awful lot yesterday, <laughs> looking at the videos <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, of the, the previous meeting, for instance. So has that made you think about how you would try and put this information out into your communities? Yes. What was going on? Because I sometimes go into the Scottish Government pages because I'm. I'm quite interested just now in water and sewerage charges because we had Alex Salmond up to our centre and that's our main bugbear just now. We're about £5,000 in debt to them and he's hoping to get it that our, our centre will be charitable status. But uh, I do tend to check up on any bills that I've been uh, going through and if they've reached the act stage yet. So I did know about it taking... Thank you. Anybody else? I'll Theresa? Tell you about it through the DTA asking us to okay. comment on, on the bill. Okay, Dowie? You were asking how we, you know, how are we going to pass this on to the community? And certainly now, I, having got to this point of knowledge about it, yes, I will. And I've already made a note that this will be in our next newsletter for the area. But, and therefore, if you, you know, information, the videos, that all helps. But w up to what point are you wanting feedback? because newsletters don't happen you know, on a weekly basis. It's a slow process. Thanks, um, it would be helpful... <coughs> excuse me. It would be helpful to have any information and feedback uh, by the 12th of November, because that's when the minister comes in front of us. Um, however, you know, this is an ongoing process, um, and, you know, you have... Uh, uh, the right at any time to let your elected representatives know what's right and wrong about certain aspects. So this is the first stage of this anyway. So, you know, there will be room for um, the committee to look at this again later. But beyond that, you know, Parliament itself as a whole will look at, at the final scenario. So don't feel bound by the 12th of no November. And if, if some flash of of brilliance comes from somebody in your communities, which often happens, you know, tell them to, to, to let us know. Can I thank you very much uh, for your evidence today? Um, I know that you're all volunteers and we're very grateful uh, for you giving up your time and coming to speak to us. Um, and I hope we did that without too much gobbledygook. Um, I suspend and we move into private session.